Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my wife ditched our family when she thought someone broke into our house. I'm 34 male. My wife, who's 42, is a stay-at-home mom. Last week when I was at work and our two eldest were at school, who are 5 and 3, my wife was sitting in the dining room table when she saw a man walking down the driveway and going to the front door. He had what she thought was a hammer. She went to the front door and the guy was trying to get in. The guy saw her and waved and tried to get in. She fled the house and ran out the back door. She left her cell phone and Apple Watch. She also left our twin daughters who are 8 months old. They were sleeping in their cribs. She ran through the neighborhood looking for someone to help her call the police. Eventually she found someone and they called the police. The police responded and cleared the house. It turns out it was just a repair guy who was supposed to be going to our neighbor's house and he had been told that no one would be home and to just come on in. She's mad at me for not being more supportive of her. I was stunned when she told me and I was surprised that she said she just left our girls there. She's always yelling at me about how I don't do enough for the kids, unlike her who sacrifices constantly. I don't think this is accurate, but it's besides the point. We've been having major issues in our marriage for a long time apart from this. She's acting like this is one of the worst things that's ever happened to her, which is making me madder and madder. I'm having a real hard time putting this one behind me. If this guy had been a bad guy, she would have abandoned our kids and just left so she could save herself. Our house isn't that big and people in the neighborhood and online know that we have kids. I honestly don't know what to do. Edit. This happened about a week ago. I spent an hour on the phone with her that day trying to console her. I tried again that night and I've been trying to take care of the kids and do all the chores at home. She's been focusing on what I think is a work from home job, but that she's lying to me about it and trying to hide it from me. Other than that, she's going out with her friends to bars. She does not believe in therapy and is refusing to go to marriage counseling that I set up for us online after the kids go to sleep. A big issue I'm having is the double standard that if I had done this, she would have never forgiven me and probably divorced me. We had a fight because when we moved to a new house, my side of the bed was on the far side from the door and that I needed to be able to stop an attacker. I've been yelled at for abandoning them when I take a shower in the morning before work and they start crying or if she's sleeping in and one begins crying while I'm changing the other and it takes me a minute to finish. I totally understand this is a fight or flight and I'm not trying to Monday morning quarterback. I have not critiqued, let alone criticized her. The closest was when I was surprised when she told me she had left the girls. Other than that call or when I came home and she was annoyed that we don't have security cameras, we haven't really talked about it. Update. Long story short, things are not going well. I feel like I'm an airplane pilot who's trying to land a plane while it's disintegrating around me and that the time is now for me to bail out. Since the last post, I've tried really hard to support her. I think I've been doing what I can to support her in the past. Anytime she wants to leave, she can. I do the lion's share of the chores at home. That means laundry, cooking, groceries, and morning and bedtime routine for the boys. We do an informal system for the dishes and the daughters. It's close to 50-50 on that. I also pay all the bills and handle all the extracurriculars. One comment that people made was that she just gave birth 8 months ago and that I should be more sympathetic. I totally get that, but since she gave birth, she has done 4 10k races, a marathon relay, and goes to a run group and dinner afterwards twice a week. She has also gone to networking events for her business that she's working on. Since that post, we have had numerous issues. We've had more days with screaming matches, and here's a list of some of the issues we've had. She woke up early on Saturday, but didn't wake me or my son up for his early practice. I slept through my alarm. Didn't do anything to help us get ready. Her only question when we came back was how late were we? The moment I came home, she went back to bed. I had all four kids by myself, which is fine. I took the kids to the store to run errands. As soon as I came back in, she got in a shower and left and refused to take any kids despite their cries. She refused to tell us where she was going. Bro needs to learn. There ain't nothing there worth fixing or saving. Time to throw in the towel. This post is like witnessing a train wreck. My man needs to file for divorce immediately. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. These stories make me feel so much better about my life. I know I can't be the only one. Am I the jerk for giving my adult daughter money to make up for missing out on her senior trip? I have three kids. We'll call them Brock, who's 24, Misty, who's 21, and Ash, who's 19. Misty graduated from high school in 2020. Due to world events, her senior year was spent at home. Things like her senior trip, spring break, and prom got canceled. 
Her school never planned a makeup trip or prom for her year and instead went back to business for the class of 2021. Misty, props to her, never complained about it. She accepted things with a sense of resignation, if that makes sense. Regardless, I can see that it hurt her to see her brother and sister get to do the things that she couldn't do. A few weeks ago, Misty reached out and asked if I can help her out with something. Her favorite actor is going to be performing on Broadway next spring and she desperately wants to see the show. She's in college and has a job but needs help paying for a ticket. She made it clear that I didn't have to pay for it if I didn't want to, but given what happened three years ago and how she took it, I felt bad for her. What she went through wasn't fair. So I bought Misty a ticket for opening night. It was expensive, yes, but frankly it was about the same amount that was spent for Ash's prom or Brock's letterman jacket and banquet. My husband doesn't agree. He thinks that I'm spoiling Misty. He doesn't see how it's fair to give our adult daughter money for a trip, but not the same for the other kids. To him, what happened in 2020 happened in 2020, and you can't do anything to fix it. I disagree. Brock and Ash got to go on trips, banquets, and prom for their senior year, and Misty spent hers in lockdown. She really had nothing to commemorate her senior year, and if anything, the money I spent on her ticket came out to less than all of the other senior year expenses for either of our other kids. I need an outside perspective. Am I the jerk or is my husband in the wrong? Edit. Husband's reasoning. If Misty was under 18, it would be a different story. My husband thinks that now she's an adult, we shouldn't be helping with funding her fun activities, like a vacation or a concert. He's on board with helping to pay for college, a car, house, or a wedding. Adult expenses. Misty wanted to buy a ticket for a cheap seat and was short $100. I decided to take the money we could have spent on one of her senior year activities for example, to pay for a prom ticket or a dress or a deposit on the trip and upgraded her ticket to a better seat. Misty is really good with her money. This show she wants to see is a once-in-a-lifetime experience for her and I agree, after everything she went through, she deserves it. She's worked hard and she needs a break. Update. It's been a few weeks and I'm happy to say that we've made progress. I sat my husband down for a talk. Mainly, I wanted to know why he thought I was spoiling Misty and while he was gung-ho about treating our other kids the same way. I may have also chewed him out for acting like missing senior year was no big deal because he didn't see how much his daughter looked hurt during Ash's year and that just because his family cut him off at 18 doesn't mean he can repeat the cycle again for his own kids after spending 25 years trying to prove that he's a better parent than they were. I hate to admit it, but it boiled down to poor communication. My husband just assumed we were giving Misty money to go somewhere on spring break when we've never done that with our other two kids. We told our kids when they were starting college that while we're happy to help them with whatever expenses they will need, we aren't going to fund any activities that will involve binge drinking or acting like jerks, like spring break. I grew up in South Texas. I know that environment. My husband told me that while he isn't upset about how much I spent, he wished I had talked to him about it first since we share finances. Now here's where I messed up. I said in my original post that I sent money to Misty. I actually purchased a ticket for her. Knowing how quickly tickets go, I went on the ticket website and just bought one for her. She originally wanted to get a seat towards the back for $160. I saw some available orchestra seats that were close to the stage for twice the amount, so I told Misty not to worry about it and I went and purchased her a better seat in the first row behind some tables. The total came to around $350. My husband and I talked it over and we made up. We're going to better work on our communication skills moving forward and be more transparent with our finances. Now here's the big update. Misty came home from college for Thanksgiving. We set her down at the kitchen table. I had the spreadsheets detailing the amount we spent for Brock and Ash's senior years and the average. We told Misty that we're sorry we never did anything to make up for her lost year. We told her that we have a budget for her. What does she want to do? Misty decided she wanted to do two things. The first is to use part of the money to spend spring break in New York. This coincides with seeing the show. Her two best friends attend college in New York, so her plan is to take a train. We live in Boston, so it's a four-hour ride and spend the week at her friend's dorm. My husband and I are planning a couple of excursions for them, like dinner at a nice restaurant, but this is all going to take time to put together. Misty would also like to use whatever is left to buy a moped. All in all, this turned out really well. Misty is ecstatic about seeing Cabaret. This will be her first Broadway show and her first solo trip. We haven't seen her this happy in a long time. Would I be the jerk for thinking about calling off my engagement because my fiancé lied to his family about us having kids? My fiancé, 23, and I, 22, plan to get married next year. Despite having a set date, there are still many things to organize. 
but I'm considering postponing or even canceling the wedding. For additional context, when we started our relationship, I told him I had always been certain I don't want to have kids. In my country, which is not the US, a woman wanting to undergo surgery faces many obstacles, and in most cases, doctors refuse to perform the procedure. This is aside from the complications women experience, unlike men who undergo vasectomies. When I told him about not wanting kids, he mentioned he wasn't considering them either. However, when I asked about a vasectomy, he admitted hesitating in case he changed his mind. Understanding his perspective, we dropped the topic. We continued dating for three more years, and during a vacation four months ago, he proposed on the beach. We decided to marry on our first date anniversary. I revisited the child topic, anticipating marital pressures, and he confirmed our shared stance. We shared the news with my parents who congratulated us joyfully. The issue arose when we visited his parents. He's the youngest with two older brothers and one older sister, all married and they have kids. During the dinner we had to celebrate our visit, we announced our engagement and everyone congratulated us. Most conversations revolved around wedding preparations, the venue, the guest list, and so on. In that moment, his sister asked us how many kids we were planning to have. Keep in mind that my fiancé had asked me in the past to avoid stating outright that we wouldn't have kids in front of his parents, knowing it could lead to arguments. I recalled his request, but wasn't sure how to respond this time. We typically said we weren't certain about the topic yet, but I didn't want to lie. Considering the significant step we're taking, I felt we needed to be honest to prevent future issues. My fiancé stepped in and mentioned we would only have one. His father and his brother started teasing him for wanting just one, suggesting we should aim for at least three like the rest so we could experience the joy of a large family like everyone else. He laughed along with them, making jokes about wanting more if I didn't make it difficult for him. At first, I planned to discuss it with him after dinner, but after the last comment, I left my plate, stood up, and asked him to join me in the backyard. It took him a moment, but he followed, avoiding direct eye contact, and commented that my sudden departure was a bit rude. When I questioned him about what he had said, he gave evasive responses, reiterating the desire to avoid arguments. I insisted that we should be truthful now to prevent future problems, but he resisted. I told him I wouldn't go along with the lie. As I was about to leave, he revealed he had changed his mind about having kids, wanting several. He had been thinking about it for months before proposing. I reminded him of our previous conversation and he admitted he hoped to convince me after marriage. I told him I wouldn't change my mind and out of nowhere he started insulting me, calling me names, saying that I'm selfish for wanting to deprive him of the best experience in the world. I didn't expect him to treat me this way, so instead of responding, I went back to his family and revealed the whole truth, stating that I would never change my mind. I then packed my bags and left. Now I'm at a hotel and after talking to my family, who told me they had crossed a line, I decided I needed to vent. I was always upfront with him about my desires and asked for honesty. Not only did he lie, but he also insulted me when he realized he couldn't manipulate me. That's why I'm considering canceling everything and ending the relationship. Would I be the jerk? Update. I've seen comments accusing me of various things, so I would like to provide some more information on certain things. Why didn't I cancel the marriage right there? Clearly, both of us said things in the whirlwind of emotions, and all I wanted at that moment was to go somewhere that I could be alone, calm down, and think instead of escalating the situation by yelling at him. However, I wasn't going to let the lie he had told go unclarified, which is why I spoke the truth before leaving. And most importantly, because I love him. If I'm honest, this is the first time we've argued this way. We got along so well from the start because we had many things in common. We both like anime, video games, animals, Halloween, and dressing up. For me, this was the definition of a soulmate. And to those who think that because I'm young, it means I don't know what I want or that I'll change my mind over the years, don't waste your time. Yes, many decisions can change in life, but I dare say everyone has at least one they know they'll stand by, regardless of time passing. For me, it's this decision, and I have many reasons to support it, which I won't delve into now to avoid further controversy. If possible, I'll try to undergo the procedure again in the future, maybe when I manage to travel to another country. I've had three partners in my life, and I've told them all the same thing from the beginning. I only encountered one person who said he wanted kids before we had a more serious relationship, so we broke up to avoid the problems I'm facing now. Be very grateful he showed you who he is before you married him. The lying and sneakiness is bad enough, but insulting you for not wanting kids? No, you would not be the jerk. In fact, I think you would be the jerk if you didn't break up with him. He didn't change his mind. He thought if he got you good enough, you'd change yours and stay with him. He was trying to manipulate you. Cancel the engagement and don't hook up with this guy. 
not the jerk. Maybe you want kids and maybe you don't. Either way, never let anyone try to pressure you into changing your mind. I found my fiancé's Christmas gift for me and I'm so disappointed. He probably thought he was being clever hiding it with the gifts I had got from my friends already. It would have been clever, except for it was a different bag than the store that I bought from. So not knowing or realizing it might be his gift, I looked and I saw. It's perfume. I'm so disappointed. I very explicitly told him what I wanted. I wanted either the Lego Orchid or an oversized anime sweater blanket. Yeah, I wear perfume, but his mother gets me a different bottle every year, so I literally have enough perfume to last me 10 years. I've never asked for perfume. This couldn't be for anyone else because he's told me he isn't buying gifts for anyone else this year because we bought a house earlier in the year. He told me exactly what he wanted and that's exactly what I ordered online. So why didn't he do the same? I'm so disappointed. Edit. No, this is not a gift for his mother. We've already gotten her a gift and she gets discounts and free perfume. No, she wouldn't have sent her gift to him. We would see her on Christmas so it wouldn't make sense. This is not a gift for someone else. He's told me I'm literally the only person he's gifting this year. Even his family gifts are ones for me that I'm tacking his name on. No, he's not the type to have set up a fake gift. We only ever do one present per year. And no, I'm not going to return his gift and get him something he doesn't like. Update. Why not buy them myself? I totally can. But as an adult, there are things you want and things you need. I don't need these items, hence them going on a list. Why do you do lists? Well, because my fiancé is bad at gifts. Like he got me a phone charger one year. He felt horrible that was what he got me, and he continued to feel bad for months, even after I'd say things like, no, it's great, I really needed it. So we started doing lists. I think that's also why I got a bit frustrated, because why ask me to make you a list if you're going to ignore it anyways? And here's the point I think some people missed. I wouldn't be disappointed if he got me something that wasn't on my list, but if it was still in my interests. I wouldn't be disappointed if it was out of the realm of my interest, as long as I could tell thought and effort went into it. Perfume is not in my interest. So I got lucky last night, and someone on Reddit actually posted their own blanket in a sub I'm in. So I shared this with my fiancé and went, Oh wow, looks like it's on sale right now. I know I've been asking for this for a while, but maybe if you didn't get it for me yet, it's on sale now. And he responded, No, I didn't get you that. I got you something romantic. Oh, so it must be something sentimental or that makes you think of me, right? No, it's romantic. And so I just dropped it at, Okay, honey, if you think it's romantic, I trust your judgment that it's something I would like. And wouldn't you know it, this morning he's home from work and goes, Where's the wrapping stuff? I want to wrap your gift. And five minutes later, the perfume is gone and there's a gift under the tree with my name. So on Christmas, I will open the perfume, be happy, and then be happy when I receive another bottle from his mother. I will talk to them and say... I really appreciate the gift, but I think I'm set on perfume after this. Thanks to everyone who gave advice. Thanks to everyone who helped me see and understand what was truly making me upset. To anyone who wasn't helpful, doesn't deserve a response. Tell him you found the bag because it was mixed in with your gifts and ask him if he knows how it got there or why it's there. Don't accuse or be upset, just talk to him. If you're right that it's his gift for you, you will have the chance to communicate your feelings and have a direct conversation about your wants and expectations. If you're wrong, then you get to stop feeling disappointed. Win-win. Assumptions are rarely, if ever, helpful, especially when it comes to relationships. This is a great opportunity to practice having uncomfortable conversations, which are absolutely a requirement of a healthy relationship. Am I the jerk for making it clear that if he keeps the grandkids away, then he will not be getting an inheritance? I'll try to keep this short. My son and his wife needed home repairs. Before living together, we had a great relationship. The problem came when his wife wouldn't follow the home rules. They're pretty simple, like clean up after yourself, don't be loud at night, and the big one was no drinking in the home, no alcohol in the home. We made this really clear, and my son knows his mother has issues related to it. We informed daughter-in-law in general terms also. The first few months seemed fine, but then it turned for the worse when the weather got cold. We couldn't prove it at the time, but we were sure they were drinking. It came to a head when while cleaning, my wife found a wine bottle in the attic. She was upset and poured it out. Apparently, it was a $300 bottle and it caused a huge fight between her and daughter-in-law. We let them stay until the renovations were done and they have been out two weeks now. Relationship has been tense and I figured we just needed time apart. My son met up with me and told us we can't see our grandkids anymore, that the incident made him rethink our relationship. I told him that was BS, that he knew the one big rule in the house 
caused stress to his mother, my wife. He told me it was final, and I told him if he goes through with this, he will be out of our will. This started another argument, and he's upset with me. Edit. The wine was open. Edit 2. I called my sister and asked her to tell me the price of this wine. Well, you were right. It wasn't $300, but around $25. I need to talk to my son and find out why she lied about that. Long night. I had a conversation after I sent a text saying that the bottle was only $25. During the argument, when the price came out, daughter-in-law thought my wife poured out all of the wine. There was a case up there worth $300. My son removed it when he realized she just found the one left out and went with the price instead of informing us that there was more wine. Not the jerk. Don't know why everyone thinks it's acceptable to be so dependent on alcohol that being asked to not drink it for a little while is a crime. You were kind enough to offer them to stay in your home and gave them some rules to follow. When they didn't follow them, you didn't even kick them out. Your son and his wife are being massively entitled here. This is one of those posts where it feels very murky and one-sided and I feel like hearing the son or daughter-in-law's side would shed a whole new light on this. Taking away access to the grandkids over a bottle of wine? I bet there are other reasons OP isn't telling us. I think OP is only telling selective bits of the situation. I reserve judgment on the basis of not having enough information. Am I the jerk for saying I don't need to be thrifty? I'm engaged to Matt. Matt was raised by a single mom, Tina. It was the first time Tina came to stay with us over Thanksgiving. I get that there is some class difference. Tina worked mainly in restaurant and retail jobs to make ends meet. My mom is an engineer and my dad is a lawyer. Tina stayed on our couch and immediately tried to make me into this thrifty housewife for her son, although I'm currently making more than him as he's finishing his post-grad internship. It became hostile about things like our hand soap in the bathroom, kitchen towels, and trash bags. We got into a major fight over them. I normally just use trash bags that originally came with our trash can. I never really paid attention to the price, but after we got back from grocery shopping and I didn't get stovetop stuffing or mashed potatoes, she was mad at me. She didn't like the grocery store I chose to get our mini Thanksgiving dinner. We went to our loft and she started yelling at me about how I didn't need to shop the way I do and that I needed to wise up money-wise and not waste her son's money. Again, I make six figures while her son is wrapping up his internship. But after that, he should match or exceed my pay in two years, so the price of milk and trash bags is not something I think of. I told her that. I don't know what happened, but she starts crying, saying about how horrible I am. I got angry at her and left her in the loft and texted Matt about her. I went to stay with my sister and her girlfriend who live on the other side of the city overnight. They were planning to come out to our mini Thanksgiving. This is Wednesday night. Matt asked if we could now skip hosting because his mom is not in a good place and I upset her. They ended up eating the turkey I was going to prepare and then made Matt rush to get stovetop stuffing and instant potatoes. He dropped overnight bag off at my sister's. Normally, Matt and my sister have a good relationship, but she yelled at him. His mom left, but Matt thinks we should discuss finances. My whole family heard about what happened over trash bags and Matt canceling Thanksgiving. My family is angry at him and his mom. My mom thinks I should cancel the engagement, but Matt and his mom think I'm awful for just leaving his mom crying in the apartment and I acted like a snobby diva to her. Not the jerk. Matt needs to have a talk with his mom and explain that you are currently the breadwinner and that you and he make financial decisions about how the two of you shop for your household. And if she has issues, she should speak to him about them. If he won't, you have a fiancé problem, not a mother-in-law problem. She went off on you in your own home because she didn't like the grocery store you shopped at for Thanksgiving. You and Matt are hosting, at which she was a guest. And then she got upset that you didn't console her after she picked a fight and went off on you. Your fiancé took her side, canceled Thanksgiving for your family, and ate the food you bought and were going to prepare with his mom. Because you upset her. Never mind that she started it and she upset you in your house. Rude Karen assumed I was flirting with her and tried to reject me. Huge mistake. This was back in 08 or 09. I was in Ecuador at the time. I was staying at a hostel and was there for just over three weeks. Less than a block away, there was an Irish pub. This pub had really good bar food that wasn't on the menu of a lot of other restaurants in the area, so because of that, it was a mixed crowd, popular with locals and backpackers because of the proximity to the hostel. I'm at the bar with some other guests from the hostel and we're expecting a few more to join us. Next to me is a bar stool, and on the other side of the bar stool are two women talking. They're obviously friends. In Spanish, I ask the woman closest to me if she's using this empty chair and if it's okay if I grab it. 
Spanish is not my first language, but I can still speak it clearly and confidently, and I grew up speaking it since I was a kid. She says to me in Spanish, with a smirk on her face, that she does not understand me and she does not speak English. I ask for the chair again in Spanish while motioning to it, and she says again that she doesn't speak English. I ended up getting the chair from a high top table that was behind us that no one was using. At that point, she turns to her friend and I hear them mumble. I don't know why he's talking to me. And I hear them chuckling to themselves, assuming that I was trying to flirt with her and I guess she rejected me. Cue petty revenge. Throughout the evening, I know that she heard me conversing in Spanish with the bartender, so by this time, she knew I definitely spoke Spanish. The napkin dispenser is directly in front of me and she asks me in Spanish if I can hand it to her. I look at her confused and I point to the napkin dispenser, then look back at her and lean in a little as if I didn't hear what she had said. She again says that she needs napkins and if I can hand her the napkin dispenser, all in Spanish. I look at the dispenser and then back at her and I very clearly say, Lo siento, no habla ingles. I'm sorry, I don't speak English. She gives me shocked Pikachu face, she turns bright red and then I give her the cold shoulder. Don't flatter yourself, lady. I wasn't trying to flirt with you. I was just wanting the bar stool. No, the bar was not loud. There was music, but easy to carry on a conversation. So yes, I'm sure I said it correctly. I am bilingual. Spanish was not my first language and I typically don't write in it, but speaking it is fine for me and I've been doing so since I was a kid. Yes, this story really happened. Seems to me like she might have been the one doing the flirting. Am I the jerk for making my husband pay for a mistake out of his allowance? My husband and I have an allowance system that prevents a lot of arguments about incidental spending. Both of our salaries go into a joint account for all bills, investments, and agreed upon purchases. The allowance is a smaller amount, $50 to $100 a week, but always equal for each of us, that gets moved to separate accounts for each of us, with the understanding that we can spend this money on whatever, no permission needed. Usually it's spent on individual hobbies and splurges. This works well for us. Today, I was looking through my husband's credit card bill that I had used recently, with his permission, to make some travel arrangements. We don't keep any secret bills. This credit card is auto-paid from our joint account. I saw a $73 charge to YouTube and asked him about it. He said he didn't remember buying anything, so I dug deeper. Turns out, he had subscribed to YouTube TV last December to watch a football game on a road trip and he had forgotten about it. I had no idea because this was his YouTube account his email notifications, his credit card. The total charge added up to $675. I admit I was annoyed and I made some short comments. You should always set a reminder to cancel these things. If you were responsible about checking your email, this might not have happened. There's a history of him being irresponsible with bills and missing important emails. I manage almost all of the finances. We're in good shape, but I hate the idea of waste. We weren't even utilizing that expensive subscription. He paid that money to watch one thing 10 months ago. I told him that to be fair, he'd have to pay the $675 out of his fun money. He had more than enough in there because he was saving for a bigger hobby purchase. I canceled the YouTube subscription on his phone, then used the banking app on my phone to move the money from his allowance account back to the joint account. I probably should have asked him to move the money himself, but I was upset. I felt more calm after doing the money transfer because to me, the matter was then settled. He got irritated and said he shouldn't have to pay out of his allowance for a simple mistake. I said, everyone has to pay for their mistakes. That's how life works. Maybe I was harsh, but the wasted money was all on him. I don't see any better way to resolve it. He pointed out that we are doing fine financially. We're fortunate that $675 out of the joint account won't affect our budgeting for the month, but it will make a big difference to his savings for his hobbies as it is close to two months of his allowance. <laughs> his allowance. It was the principle of the matter to me. I'm very careful with money, no matter how well we do financially. I'll always look for good deals and avoid frivolous spending. So, am I the jerk for moving my husband's fun and allowance money to pay for a mistake that he made? Edit. I appreciate the responses, as reading the objective viewpoints helped me realize I behaved badly. More punitive than fair. Marriage is a partnership, not a balance sheet, and honest mistakes happen. I reacted out of irritation about the money without thinking about the bigger picture. I called my husband and apologized. He said he didn't blame me for being irritated as he was irritated about the money too, but he appreciated the apology. He said we could talk later about moving the money back or not. He should be grateful that he has such a great mom. This is how I feel. 
like the money is being micromanaged and OP is treating her husband like a kid. I could never. The entire system of allowances, etc. Best option is to have a joint account and then also have separate accounts. A set amount of money goes into the joint accounts each month to cover bills and savings, but the majority of each individual's expendable income can stay within their personal account and they can do with it whatever they want to as long as it doesn't jeopardize the overall finances of their marriage and partner. I would never share my finances with someone who wanted to have allowances. They can treat their own income that way if it works best for them, but I don't want someone else controlling how I spend my money so long as I'm not misspending or hurting our overall marriage. If he only used it once ages ago, he might be able to get a refund by reaching out to customer support. I assume you'll be the one doing that for him. Not the jerk, because it seems like he's habitually irresponsible with money and this is the proverbial straw. Unfortunately, you're the jerk. I'm like you and that I'm very careful about charges and reviewing my credit card bill, so he or you should definitely be doing that. He shouldn't have been so careless, but it was a mistake. Everyone paying for their mistakes may be how life works, but you're a team and it doesn't affect your finances. Let's use the golden rule here. Would you want him to punish you for a mistake like this? OP. You're right. My reaction was out of irritation, but it was purely a mistake on his part. Despite the carelessness, he didn't do it on purpose. After having some time to calm down and read these objective responses, I realize I'm in the wrong and I will apologize to him. To be honest though, I would pay it back from my own account if it were me. I would feel too guilty about the money and the mistake otherwise. While it was a mistake and he should have been more rigorous, he's not your 12-year-old kid. Allowances, taking away allowances. You both are adults here. A mistake was made, it's been corrected, and see if there's a pattern. This isn't a mistake where you've gone broke or can't pay your bills, etc. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Bruh, if I make some sort of mistake and waste $650, I'm not going to expect anybody else to pay it. That's up to me. I did it. I should take accountability for my actions. Accountability though, Karen, that's that's the word. Uh, Reddit, you know, they're, they're just not big fans of that whole concept. No wonder they're all so crazy. My boyfriend's female friends have disinvited me from multiple holidays. Should I accept this? I'm in a long distance relationship with my boyfriend and today we've had a really difficult day communicating due to me feeling quite depressed. He's been out drinking all day with two female friends and I've asked him if we can chat about a few important things when he gets home. He gets home at about 10 p.m. and is pretty wasted so we don't really get anywhere with our discussion. He then tells me around 11 p.m. the two girls are heading over because one has just had a huge fight with her boyfriend. I ask him to ask them to go somewhere else as I really want to sort out our issues and he lies and says, they probably won't turn up. 10 minutes later, he says they're out the door but when I dig a little, it's actually only one of them. They are friends, but they do have a history. He's aware that I'm not comfortable with them on a one-on-one -on -one when booze is involved. Not through lack of trust, but more so I feel it's disrespectful to me. He begins to hang up on me, telling me I'm being irrational when I keep asking him to please respect my boundary. So I tell him if he won't listen to my boundary, I'll ask her, because we went to school together and we are reasonably friendly. He continues to go off on me, telling me I'm irrational, while she tells me how platonic they are. But neither acknowledge the fact that as a long distance couple, one thing I don't feel comfortable with is drunken sleepovers with old flings, as I don't feel like we need the added stress and I know he would flip if I did. Why do people stay in relationships with people who do this kind of stuff? I just don't get it. I've clearly laid out all these boundaries to him multiple times through prior conversations. Am I the jerk for messaging her when he ignored me? I would love to hear what people feel a fair compromise would be and also if I need to consider if my expectations are too high. For context, the clique is my boyfriend, two girls, and one guy. I attended school with the girls and briefly dated my boyfriend's male friend six years ago. They also have all done things together in the past, kissing only. My boyfriend and I began dating in December of 2022 and I've known him since childhood, but we lost touch for over 15 years. At the beginning of our relationship, I sensed negativity from this group of friends, but was reassured by all of them that there was no issue. My boyfriend and myself also cleared things with his friend who I had dated who assured us there were no unresolved issues and that he was happy for us. Fast forward three months and they were drinking and book a holiday. My boyfriend initially invited me, but the group stated they didn't want it to be a couple's holiday and therefore they didn't want me to go. His male friend at this point cited our history as a reason why he felt uncomfortable. 
I reluctantly accepted this, but assured my boyfriend I didn't think it was appropriate for the past to be used like this in the future, as I felt we should all move forward and accept the present. The issue did cause a rift between myself and my boyfriend, affecting how secure I felt in the following months, as I wasn't sure how he would respond in future instances. Another trip was discussed, and my boyfriend said he would ask his friend not to exclude me, but a while after this conversation occurred, his friend again messaged their group chat to request if it could be just friends. By this point, my boyfriend has not stood up for me regarding this issue for many months, and last week, I became fed up of the atmosphere and messaged two of the friends asking why they kept covertly uninviting me. They both responded very defensively, and the male again reiterated our history as a relevant reason. He also stated the four of them have a special friendship, and time together as a four is valuable. My boyfriend has seconded this. He said initially he would have liked us to get along, which we do, but that that's obviously not what they want, and despite my efforts, they prefer it just being the four of them on holidays and trips. He also said he wouldn't be against supporting the exclusion of me on certain trips, as you can't force them to want to spend time with you. All I want is for us to just be mature, squash it and move on, but it does feel like no one wants to do the same. It also feels like my past dating history is being unfairly used to justify this. I have no issues with him remaining friends with them, I only take issue with the clicky nature and I feel that this can't really coexist healthily with our relationship. I'm very comfortable with conflict resolution and would happily move past this, but I sense these people aren't and won't want to. We're currently on a break while we both evaluate our boundaries. I know I shouldn't pass the blame onto his friends, but it does aggravate me that their preferences are having such an impact on our relationship, and rather than ask them to reevaluate their position, he finds it easier to blame me, telling me, you're letting it ruin us. They really are a childish group, and your boyfriend is really no help. Don't force yourself into that group dynamic. It doesn't sound like it would be fun or healthy for you. If I were in your position, I would develop friends and hobbies outside of him and his friend group. Take some trips without him. Don't make him the center of your life and don't give the stupid friend group the pleasure of knowing that you are bothered. You should also consider if he balances the time that he's spending with you versus taking trips with them. If not, then you have a discussion with him and decide if the relationship is worth the drama. OP. That's the thing. I generally don't have complaints about how he splits his time. We're long distance and I live in England for the most part and them in Ireland, but myself and him visit back and forth. I just don't like the precedent that it's okay for me to be excluded from future trips from the get-go. But at the same time, if he himself is saying, I want it to only be the four of us, I don't know how to feel about that considering the way that it's all happened. I'm torn between respecting his wishes and ignoring them or insisting on more respect. Final Update I've explained my feelings over and over and I've now walked away. I cannot maintain self-respect while accepting a partner who harbors and encourages this type of exclusion and quite frankly is bullying me. It's an extremely hard choice but needed for my own sense of self and peace of mind. Am I the jerk for reaching out to the bride's makeup artist behind the bride's back and almost getting the entire bridal party fired as clients? The bride, Rika, is super nice and understanding. Her main request to the bridesmaids was having hair and makeup done by the same hair and makeup artist, with Rika paying the morning of the wedding for the getting ready hangout. Rika had her mind set on a specific artist that offered a fancy bridal experience with lots of extras and she was very excited about it. I wear bold, dramatic makeup daily. I had no issue sticking to Rika's very different preferred style for her wedding. However, over the last few years, I had a number of painful reactions to makeup products and I was never able to figure out the trigger. If I immediately take makeup off, pain goes away in hours and discomfort fades in a few days. While reactions are rare, I now stick to specific makeup lines that I know work for me. I asked Rika if she could ask the hair and makeup artist what products they use or I could do my own makeup while everyone else was getting theirs done, trying for the same look. But Rika just kept saying that she had a reputable makeup artist that followed professional standards of hygiene and that the makeup would be quite light. It seemed in her head reactions could only happen with a shady makeup artist or heavy makeup. Rika said she could pay for me to have a trial done on the same day she'd have hers so I don't have to worry. I agreed like an idiot. Then I realized that didn't work because if the makeup artist used a triggering product, I would still have a painful reaction just on a different day. I messaged Rika again and I had the same pointless conversations. The trial day was coming. 
I didn't want to just cancel. It made sense in my head to message the makeup artist with my question directly. Unexpectedly, the makeup artist straight up said she can't work on me for liability reasons as I can't identify problem ingredients. Not even using products I name is safe. She also asked if the bride was aware. Turns out, Rika had filled out a form that confirmed no one had known makeup sensitivities. I don't blame Rika. She signs medical and customs forms without reading them. But the makeup artist was enraged. She almost fired Rika as a client five weeks ahead of the wedding. They worked it out. I haven't even heard of a makeup artist with such forms or such a hardcore stance in general. Rika and her maid of honor since implied I was intentionally sabotaging so I could do my usual attention-grabbing makeup. I'm hoping that's maid of honor and bride stress talking and not what Rika really thinks of me. Several people told me I should have just risked it, considering my reactions and the chance of them occurring in the first place are relatively minor. The more people say this, the more I'm thinking that maybe that is what was expected of me as a friend. Obviously, my worst move was messaging the makeup artist directly, but I wasn't getting anywhere with Rika, and I was afraid that she'd be mad if I just said I wasn't doing the hair and makeup thing. But the more I think of it, going behind her back on something so important to her may make me a jerk. Edit. People keep asking about patch testing. My reactions only trigger on my lips and eyelids. Arm swatching or whatever doesn't help. Edit 2. I've been to doctors and had allergy tests done. Nothing. They think it's not a true allergy, but a reaction to something my body finds particularly irritating for some reason. There's no obvious common ingredient. I have every outward symptom for referred pollen energy, but not an actual pollen allergy. Not the jerk. Addressing your medical needs directly is totally reasonable. To be honest, I would be willing to quit the bridal party over it. You never know when a skin reaction could turn to something more serious. Not the jerk. A reputable makeup artist would be okay with you bringing your own products for her to use if you're allergic. Am I the jerk for leaving my boyfriend when his ex passed, leaving him to take care of his kids full time? I, female 26, have been with my boyfriend who's 30 for two years now. He has two kids who are six and four with his ex-girlfriend. She moved to another state with the kids to be near her family when they broke up three years ago. He got them on vacations only. I knew all this when I started dating him. I had no issue with this, but told him up front that I didn't want to be a parent. My mom basically made me raise my five younger siblings. The oldest of them is six years younger than me, and I had to change his diapers and feed him formula. I went low contact with my family when I left home at 18, I can't imagine doing that again. He was also snipped after the last kid and didn't want any more. He was fine with me not wanting to be a parent and just be a bonus adult. We were taking it slow and I didn't even meet his kids until a few months back. We took a trip together and got along great. Things changed two months ago when his ex passed. The kids were really sad as they moved into his house. We were not living together but he asked if I could move in to help him out, just for a while. I couldn't refuse and I stayed, but I started hating it again. I hated how clingy the kids became and how much responsibility I had. I did my best, but my mental health started getting worse every day. I didn't even get help from my boyfriend because he was struggling too. Last week was especially bad since the younger one had a cold and wanted me to nurse her back to health exactly the way her mom would have. The soup wasn't the same. The song and story weren't the same. I didn't hug her the same way her mom did, etc., were some of the long lists of complaints. I know she's grieving, but I was already working from home and stressed too. When I told my boyfriend he should take over, he said that they need me more since I am a mom. It triggered me. I didn't want to be held to a mom's responsibilities again. I told him I can't do this. He said I needed to stop acting like a kid and step up. I understood that if I stayed, my whole life would be like this, never measuring up, never being enough, and all the responsibilities of a mom. I left yesterday, moved in with a friend. My boyfriend, well, ex-boyfriend, is blasting my phone, calling me a jerk. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. No one should feel obligated to parent someone else's kids, and you've already done that once. Don't do it again if your mental health isn't up to it. The fact that he said, since you're a mom, shows he hasn't understood or cared to understand any of your past experiences and the boundaries that you've established. Why is he not at home with his sick kid? Listen, he wants you to move in so you can take over all the parenting decisions and responsibilities when he can continue on about his life. He even called you mom. After hearing about what you've been through, he still had the nerve to do this. He needs to step up and be there for his kids 
and you did the right thing. Am I the jerk for turning down my stepdad's offer to walk me down the aisle? I, 27 female, have chosen to walk down the aisle alone on my wedding day. The decision was made for two reasons. My dad passed when I was seven and he would be my number one choice if he were alive, but he's not. And two, my mom has made it perfectly clear that she would find it disrespectful to my stepdad if she walked me down the aisle and so we would not do it. Given that both my parents are out and I don't want to ask my paternal grandparents to do too much, my grandma and I are already sharing a special dance. Walking alone is what I feel the most comfortable doing. I could ask my stepdad and even when I contemplated my decision, I knew he would want to do it. But it would make me sad to have him walk me instead of my dad if I'm honest. I think my stepdad is a good man and he has tried his very best to be a dad for me. But I didn't want a dad when I lost mine. I wanted my dad. Nobody else was ever going to be able to fill that role in my heart. I asked my mom and stepdad if they would like to do a joint toast or two separate ones and whether they would like to walk down the aisle or dance to specific songs. While discussing this, my stepdad asked who I would be walking down the aisle with and I told him I was walking alone. He offered to do it and I said it was a lovely offer but I would walk alone. He pressed me on why and I said it felt like the best option. He said it would mean the world to him if he could do it, if just once he could feel like he's a real dad and not just the second place to my dad. I told him I understood but it was not an option on the table. He said he was already being shamed by having to watch me dance with my grandma when it should be a father-daughter dance. But to have everyone watch me walk alone when they know I have a stepdad is going to send a very big message. I know people will ask about details on our relationship, etc. I met my stepdad when I was 9 and he married my mom when I was 10. He offered to adopt me and give me his last name and I turned him down 5 times in the 8 years that I lived with them. He was married before my mom and he lost his wife and his unborn baby in an accident. He was also made sterile by the same accident. He always longed to be a dad. We got along well, but our relationship was always more to him than it was to me. Where he sees a daughter and wants a daughter, I see a good man and someone who is a great spouse to my mom and good to me, but does not fill the father role he wants to emotionally for me. Physically he did, but emotionally I never felt like he was my dad and everyone in our lives is aware that I feel as though I have only one dad and my stepdad is my stepdad. My mom and stepdad are not paying or contributing to the wedding in any way. My fiancé and I both have savings and we're putting those into the wedding. Though our wedding will be small since we want to prioritize other things. My mom and stepdad say that I'm rude and heartless for turning down their offer. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The only rude ones are your mom and stepdad. While I can definitely sympathize with him, he's making your wedding about himself. He may be a good man, but he's definitely very selfish in this particular case. Stand your ground. It's your wedding. Your dad must have been amazing and I'm sure he'll want you to be happy on that day and every other day. No jerks here, but this post, I'll be honest, shows once again why step-parents don't like to invest emotionally in their stepkids. You're the jerk. Publicly embarrassing a man who wanted to be your dad, wanted to adopt you, who raised you, who loves you, rejecting him because he's not someone else. Wah, wah. Thousands of kids in foster care would love to have an adoptive dad like yours. And your mom's a jerk for not getting you help. It's your day. Do what you want. But you're cold-hearted and apparently don't mind that character trait being the star attraction at your wedding. Doing what you want doesn't mean getting to humiliate people who raised you and did nothing wrong. Your stepdad sounds like he will be a class act and not embarrass you. If I were him, I'd just probably RSVP no and step back. It's an invitation, not a summons, right? You clearly care more about the fantasy image of your biological dad than the person in front of you. I hope your stepdad wakes up and makes sure you don't inherit anything if your mom passes first. No hard feelings since he's nothing to you. Completely agree. For the 45 seconds it takes to walk, it would be a massive thank you for the emotional, physical, and financial effort he has helped with over the years for a kid that wasn't his own. You're the jerk. Never raise kids that aren't yours. They won't appreciate you and will only resent you more and more. Don't fall for the fairy tale stories. It never works out that way. Well, what do you think? Is Opie the jerk or not? Please let us know. New teacher is stealing school supplies that the parents bought. I'm 35, female, and my daughter, Natty, who's 8, started a new school this August. We moved from one coast to another and we had some adjusting to do. When she started school, her teacher gave us a list of supplies she needed. 
Things like 24 packs of crayons, 300 pencils, etc. These are examples. I don't remember exact numbers, but it was quite a lot. I got everything on the list. The school is located in a very good district and most parents are well off. And as far as I know, most parents have bought everything that was on the list. You'd think that it was done and dusted, but no. We're a month in and Natty just brought a new list home which lists the same supplies in large quantities. I thought it might have been a mistake and messaged other mothers in our group chat and they were as surprised as I was. However, the list was confirmed by an email we received from the teacher asking us to bring the supplies as soon as possible and that lists will be supplied to us every four to six weeks. I know that kids go through a lot of supplies, but not this many. It was all very odd. I tried to snoop a little and find the teacher on Facebook, but I couldn't find her. However, when my friend came over, she was able to locate her. It seems that the teacher blocked all the parents on Facebook. Turns out that the teacher is selling supplies, crayons, etc. on the marketplace and she had a page and a link to her website. To say that I was shocked would be an understatement. It seems that she's asking the parents to buy extra supplies and then resells it. What other reason does she have to require over 400 packs of crayons every four to six weeks? Like I said, most parents supplied everything on the supply list. I've kept it to myself because I'm unsure of what to do, but I am considering reporting the teacher to school so they can properly investigate. I thought it was the right thing to do, but my sister-in-law is a teacher, and she told me I would be the jerk if I were to do that, because kids go through a lot of supplies and no way the teacher resells them. It's probably a coincidence, but I don't know. It doesn't sit right with me. I haven't told other parents about my suspicions because I don't want to start a witch hunt before school can investigate. But would I be the jerk for reporting her? Speaking as a former teacher, this is disgusting and outrageous. Get her fired. Go straight to the principal, and if he does not fire her, take it to the school board. The teachers union will not protect her on this. Absolutely not the jerk. Unbelievable. I'm not a teacher, but I have a lot of teacher friends and thought this was going to be one of those the teacher puts all the supplies into a communal pot for the school year type situations. But taking them and reselling them? That is absolutely wild. OP, not the jerk. Report her and don't let the fallout of her actions trouble you one bit. Not the jerk. I'd request a meeting with school officials and tell them discretion is a must and bring evidence of her reselling on Marketplace and the two lists, the times apart between lists, etc. Bring all the receipts you have. Tell them that you aren't trying to witch hunt this teacher, but that you also do not want to be supplying school supplies if she is reselling them and that you find it ridiculous that you need to supply new products every four to six weeks as it is unreasonable. Also, that you haven't brought the Marketplace reselling to the attention of other parents as to not cause an undue attack on said teacher, but you are sure they would feel the same way and they find the new supply list every four to six weeks ridiculous. You're the jerk. People like you have no idea how hard it is being a teacher in today's public school system. I was a teacher for four years until I was wrongfully fired due to the constant harassment from students. I couldn't take it anymore and said some things to those brats that the board did not agree with. Maybe if they paid us appropriately, we wouldn't have to steal supplies and resell them just to keep a roof over our heads. This practice is much more common than you'd think. We also would keep a decent amount of pooled money from the field trip collection. It's just a perk of being a teacher. Sorry, not sorry. One day we'll all strike and straight up quit. Who's going to teach your brats then? It definitely won't be me. By the way, thanks for paying my college debt. With all of my unemployment benefits and now zero college debt, I'm pretty much retired at 28 years old. I'm seeing a few of the dads I met while I was a teacher. Hopefully one of them will be having a baby with me soon. Then we'll see which one gets excited when I tell them we're going to be parents. He'll be the easiest one to hook for child support. And if he wants a paternity test, my girlfriend who works at the hospital knows how to fake them. She makes over $100,000 a year under the table because of this. She's already told me whatever I need, she'll do it for free because that's what friends do. You were a teacher? God help our public school system. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the teacher? Please let us know. <laughs> I'd create a new Facebook account and meet up with her to buy some of the items. That's when you confront her and record the whole thing, post it on YouTube and watch it go viral. Hopefully you'd get more thumbs up than we do. Most of our viewers don't click that like button and it breaks our hearts. 
Hint, hint. Karen demands I bake her a wedding cake at a huge discount. I, 32 female, have a friend, Ashley, who's 33, who's getting married the first week of November. We've been friends since we were kids, and I'm also a bridesmaid in her wedding. We've been talking about wedding stuff for the past year, as I recently married in April, so it's been fun doing wedding stuff together until Ashley drops some bad news. The person responsible for the cake for her wedding is moving and is no longer able to do it. She was refunded her money, but now is out of a cake. I'm a cake decorator myself. I was a teacher, and this is my first year as a school administrator, but I've held jobs in high-end bakeries and make cakes for fun out of my house. I don't have a cake business as I don't want one. Ashley asked me if I can do her wedding cake. I at first declined as I never do cakes for large events, but with the date coming up and her not being able to find anyone, I caved. Ashley wants a four-tiered cake with four different flavors and 100 cupcakes, 25 of each flavor. The decorations will require me to order specialty molds and I'll have to hand paint some gold onto the cake. Total cost came out to $825, $100 more than the previous baker. Ashley was upset and said I was overcharging, but I showed her the breakdown. I used the same pricing system as one of the bakeries I worked at and it wasn't even the most expensive one. I told her I would do it for the other quote if she was strapped for money, but Ashley then asked me to do it for only $150. When I asked why, Ashley said since she's my friend, she could get a good deal and she could use the money to upgrade the hotel for their honeymoon, to think of it as my wedding gift to her. I told her she was getting a good deal as I was willing to go to the price point of the previous baker, but she mentioned that I did my sister's cake for free several years ago and do free birthday and anniversary cakes for my immediate family all the time. I told her family and friends are not the same. Plus, I had more time to do my sister's cake, as I had less responsibilities as a teacher back then compared to what I do now. She told me I needed a friend discount, so I said, The discount is, you get 0% off 100% of the time, and if you keep bothering me, I'll even add tax. Basically, Ashley didn't like that response, and has told the rest of the bridal party what I said, so I'm getting pressure from 9 additional people to drop the price, though some say to half it instead of dropping it to 150. My parents paid for my wedding, so their main argument is I don't need the money nearly as much as Ashley does, which they only know because they saw me using my parents' credit card several times when out wedding shopping. Only her maid of honor, her sister, thinks Ashley is being unreasonable. My husband thinks I should drop out of the wedding and not give her anything, but he also doesn't like Ashley or her fiancé. He thinks she's a spoiled brat. Am I the jerk? Edit. I've only paid for my dress for her wedding. I'm also doing my own hair and makeup myself, but the only money I've spent so far for her wedding on my end is for my dress and shoes. Edit 2. To clarify, baking is a skill. Paying for just ingredients and molds would be maybe $150 to $200, but is already factored into the cake cost you buy. What most home bakers base their price on is the intricacy of the design, the difficulty, their clientele location, and most importantly, time. Then cakes are priced with that combined with the serving size. She has 120 guests. A serving is $4.75 per person, so $570. Because 100 doesn't divide by 12, but is still a large number of cupcakes, I discounted the cupcakes from $3.50 per decorated wedding cupcake to the price of a regular plain cupcake with no decorations, which is $2.50 so the cupcakes were $2.50. Total price is $8.20. I upped it to $8.25 so the extra $5 could pay for the box to deliver the cake, which I don't normally have in my house as I don't typically make cakes that big. Not the jerk. If they all want you to drop the price, they can all throw in $100. A wedding cake and 100 cupcakes for a wedding isn't the same as Aunt Betty's 58th birthday. That's pressure times 10. Not the jerk, and I agree with your husband. You should give Ashley a $700 gift on top of what you probably already spent? No, her entitlement is not your problem. Plus, the harassment is unacceptable. And the longer she waits, the less chance she's going to get her over-the-top cake and more likely she'll wind up with a sheet cake from Walmart. Not the jerk. Also, remind her on something super important. What if the cake isn't exactly what she thought it should look like in her head? Like, what if the image doesn't match her vision? Do you know how much of a hassle you'd go through to get any sort of payment? Or she'd try to harass you into a refund because it's not what she ordered. She's trying to scam you out of a free cake. For goodness sake, 
Four tiers, all different colors, that alone is a nightmare to get just right. Plus, the specialty molds you may not even use again are very limitedly. The cupcakes? Oh no. Because you'd have to ice them at the wedding, unless the reception venue has a decent sized walk-in fridge unit to store said cupcakes and cake in to avoid melting from the heat. But hand frosting 100 cupcakes with frosting that may be different to each plus decorating? Oh no. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Ashley? Please let us know. No wonder your husband doesn't like her. Never let an Ashley Ashley all over you. You'll always talk about Karen, but you sleeping on Ashley's bruh. Karen demands to put a tracker on my phone. I'm 28, female. My life has not turned out the way I wanted it to. I still live at home with my parents who are extremely controlling. All my friends have left the country and so I'm on my own a lot. Most of my time is spent at home, at work or going on solo walks. I don't drink, I don't go to the gym or play sports anymore. I don't have hobbies outside the house. I haven't dated anyone for seven years. All in all, very uninteresting life. My one solace is being outdoors in nature and walking. My parents aren't happy with this. They think I shouldn't go out on walks by myself because it's dangerous, in their words. I knew it would be better to ease their concerns if I had someone to go on walks with me, but I don't. My mom has been trying to get me to put share my location on my phone with her for years. I understand that she worries about my safety. However, the big problem for me is I know it's not just about my safety. She'll use it to become my stalker. I know this because she has my dad share his location with her and vice versa. She sits and stares at her screen and will say things like, Oh, your father just left tennis. Oh, your father has just arrived at work. Oh, your father is leaving the pub. Now, I don't have anything to hide, but it is one boundary that I've held to and I've been so proud of myself for not caving. Today, I decided I'd take a trip up the coast and go for a walk along the sea. I told my parents about my plans at 10.30 a.m. My mom asked that I call her and keep in touch. Once I got there, 2 p.m., I called her and told her where I was. I also told her what walk and route I would be taking. I didn't tell her when I would be home, but she also didn't ask. I also didn't message to say I was on my way home. My parents were furious when I arrived back, 8 p.m. My dad told me that I no longer had a say and that it was mandatory for me to have a tracker on my phone. I told him that I had done everything asked of me. I had called, explained where I was going, etc. I also said they could have called me if they were that concerned about my whereabouts. So as a result, I have been punished. The car that I drive is technically my dad's and so he has taken the keys away. He says that I can buy my own car or grant them access to my tracking information. They said they would never do this to me, hold the fact that they bought the car over my head. Also, it makes no sense for me to buy a new car now. I'm at the final stage of a graduate recruitment process and if I'm successful, I'll be moving to London in September. However, I need to survive between now and then and without a car, the little life I have is impossible. So, am I the jerk for refusing to let them put a tracker on my phone when their concern is my safety? Edit. My dad hasn't told me that he has taken the keys. I've got a work event today and he plans for me to not find them when I need to go. Your parents are incredibly toxic, but you may need to put up with this until you can get out. OP. I'm in my bedroom with my door closed and my dad just walked past and said, stupid jerk, at my door. Try not to cry that my wonderful day has been ruined it does feel toxic. Can you take public transport? OP. Yes, I can, but the public transport system here is not very good. My work is a 10-minute drive away, but via public transport, it would take me an hour. I do work from home most days though, so that is something. I could also go to parks that are within walking distance for some outdoors. Do you pay to live there? OP. I only pay a nominal amount of 200 pounds a month as per my dad's request. I do feel guilty about it as I know people normally pay a lot more than that. Does your dad know that your mom stalks him? Yes, he does and he doesn't seem to mind. Do they pay for your phone? They don't pay for my phone, though the car is theirs. Unfortunately, the car I bought had an engine failure. I couldn't afford to just buy another car, so this was the compromise solution. I had actually been considering asking to buy the car from them, but it now seems silly, especially with the London move potentially happening and this drama. Update. Things were very frosty the next couple of days. My mom eventually came to me and said that she was going to address the elephant in the room. She said that she was very disappointed in me, but as I didn't care about her, she will just have to live without it. The tracker on my phone. 
I think she expected me to cave at that point, but I didn't. I said, thank you for understanding, and that was it. The car keys were returned to the drawer and nothing more was said about it from anyone, including my dad. To this day, I have no idea why the 180 degree flip happened. Although you have all helped me realize that I have an unhealthy codependent relationship with my parents, I think it will just take time to set boundaries and learn how to be my own person. I still love them a lot and I know they love me too, even though we aren't the type of family that says so. Which leads me to my other news, I got the job in London. I've officially moved out and I'm living there now. It still feels surreal. I know it's going to take some time to get used to living independently, but I'm ready to be my own person and learn how to do things on my own. Honestly, I had given up hope that this day would ever get here. I feel so much happier and can genuinely say that I'm proud of myself. If anyone has any tips for living away from home for the first time, please let me know. Am I the jerk for calling off my engagement over a dog? For some context, I, 24 female, have been dating my fiancé, Todd, since early 2021. He's been an amazing person since the very beginning. We met at my job where he started becoming a regular and even asked me out. Todd isn't a huge fan of animals, unlike me, but this was never really a problem because he got along with my dog. I've had my dog since a little before I graduated high school. I volunteered at a local shelter when she came in. A shy little beagle puppy, Nala. She wasn't doing well at the shelter, so I offered to foster her, and well, the rest is history. I moved out of my dad's house when I turned 18, and other than some essentials, she's all I brought with me when I was thrown into adulthood. I got a cheap apartment after that, and it's just been me and her ever since. I don't believe it would be an understatement to say I love her more than anything. Todd knew this. Recently, I found out I was pregnant, about two months ago. Todd seemed to be more and more agitated with Nala since then, even asking if I'd consider rehoming her. I said no and explained that I was worried about her not eating. She has some pretty bad separation anxiety. We got into a huge argument about it where he began to complain about her fur being all over and about the way that she always sits by my feet when we do things and how I let her on all my furniture. It's my apartment and I bought all the furniture. He also went so far as to say I'd be a terrible mother and neglect our baby if I didn't get rid of her. We went back and forth for a while and by the end of it, he was just kind of really silent. I assumed that was the end of it and went to our bedroom to calm down a bit. Nala followed me into the room and I sat with her on the floor for a while, just thinking about some things. We didn't talk for the rest of the night. The next morning, I went through my routine, put Nala in her pen. Todd goes to work earlier in the morning than I do and I went to work. When I came back, she was gone. Her bed was gone, her toys were gone, and Todd was gone. At first, I was panicking. I thought someone had stolen my Nala. I searched the whole house, and then I called Todd. He didn't answer. I called maybe 15 times before I gave up. At that point, I was starting to think a little more clearly and noticed that all of her things were missing. Her toys, her treats, her pen, her leashes, even her box of winter things that sits in my bookshelf. Then I was angry. Todd is the only person who has a set of keys to my apartment other than me and my landlord, and my landlord adores Nala. I angrily texted Todd a paragraph demanding my dog back or I'd call the police and begin calling shelters to see if I could find her. I had no luck. Todd read the messages, but he didn't reply, only to come home about an hour later angrily shouting at me as soon as he came in. This quickly led to another screaming match where he broke one of my picture frames and I threatened to call off the wedding and still call the police. I eventually managed to find out he had given my dog to his cousin who lives in another state. He brought up again how I'd be a terrible mother and how he needed to do this for our family and that I was only being difficult because I'm pregnant. I told him that he no longer had a family and to get out of my apartment. That was two days ago. I've been crying ever since and I'm working on getting his cousin to give me back my Nala. I blocked Todd on everything but now his family won't stop harassing me on everything and his mother is threatening to sue me for the money they put into the wedding. There's still time for them to get a refund. They only paid for catering. I'm really upset right now, but am I the jerk for how I reacted? Edit. I should have specified, but I wrote this while I was worked up, but I did file a police report. They aren't being too helpful at the moment, but they said they would try to contact departments in the other state. Update. I'm talking to the police and to Ted's cousin, but I also did reach out to his family. Apparently, Todd had told them that I was a scammer that I'd taken the money for the wedding and was planning to divorce him for the money afterward. He also claimed that I was neglecting my dog and that's why he had to give her away. She's super nervous when I'm not around, so I'm worried they might believe him. 
I did send his parents a nice lengthy set of screenshots of all the vile things he sent to me and a few of the voicemail recordings. His mother apologized and claimed she had handled him. I've always been pretty close with his family, so I was also pretty upset with the way they reacted after I called off the engagement. Now I understand why. I'm changing all my locks and I already have a ring doorbell on my apartment and I'm going to get more cameras. I do hear you though. I'm honestly not sure I want to bring a baby into this cluster mess. Thanks again and I'll update you once I've got my fur baby back and his life is ruined. My mom ditched me for her new family, so I got revenge. I'm 19 male. When I was born, my mom was 17 and my dad was 19. My dad has been in prison the majority of my life for nonviolent charges. My mom got married to my stepdad when I was 10. Just to clarify, my mom and dad were never married. They dated each other and eventually hooked up and had me. My problems with my mom started when she got pregnant with my sister and then after she had my sister, she got pregnant again and had my brother and I became like a ghost she hardly paid attention to. She neglected me emotionally and I felt like I was unwanted in her life. I didn't matter anymore. As I grew up, I continued to try to get her to talk to me, but she was always busy with my brother and sister. Every family activity they did together, she always excluded me. It was always my stepdad and mom and my siblings, except for me, like I wasn't part of the family. This is how I came to the conclusion that my mom hates me or that she disliked me. As I mentioned before, I have two younger siblings who are four and nine. One day, my mom comes into my room. She's all dressed up and racing around and I ask her if she's going somewhere. She tells me no and I go back to playing on my computer. No later than 15 minutes, I hear the garage door go up. So I race downstairs thinking, what the heck? Sure enough, my mom, stepdad, and my sister and brother are all dressed up and in the truck and I'm standing outside feeling really uncomfortable. The look she gave me as she jumped into the truck made me feel that I was interrupting her. There wasn't any, oh yeah, sorry. It was just a look of absolute disgust. I don't cry very easily, but something about the whole thing really got to me. And I went back inside and cried a bit, but then I got over it. It wasn't the first time this happened. She texted me 10 minutes later, telling me they're going to the park. I don't respond because I would have just worked myself up again. Fast forward, they get home. I was eating dinner and my nine-year-old sister rushes in after my mom, super excited to tell me about everything they had done. They hadn't gone to the park. My mom had lied to me, saying they went to the park when they had actually gone to Dave & Buster's. They also went to go get milkshakes and went shopping. I was visibly crushed by it, and my sister noticed I had gotten upset. I could tell my mom was about to start making excuses and making the circumstances my fault, so to keep my little sister and brother from seeing that, I excused myself to my room quietly. It just sucked. I've been trying so hard to be a good son, despite the selfishness of my mother and her chaotically selfish ways have on me. But once I realized that crap isn't normal, I started questioning our relationship. I didn't see any safe way out of this without ending up on the streets, broke, 19 years old, unemployed by the way. So I joined the army. It was a spur of the moment thing and she still doesn't know. I can handle it and it's the first decision I've actually made on my own. I cannot tell you how excited I am to leave for basic training soon. Edit. I would like people to know that I don't hate my brother or sister. I like them and they also like me and we have good memories of spending time together. At this point, they are the only thing I consider family and I hope they understand why I moved away. I hope that when I come back from the army, they'll still see me as their big brother. I would also like people to know that my grandparents from my mom's side of the family passed already and my grandparents from my biological dad's side of the family also passed. My biological dad is the only kid they had. My mom only has one sister and she's married and they have three kids around the same age as me and she and her husband live paycheck to paycheck and I don't want to be a burden to them. That's why I never went to live with them. Update. Today, my biological dad called me and said that he got out of prison two weeks ago. He's living in his parents' house. My grandparents, when they passed, they left their house to my dad. So I went to go see him. We had a good conversation. He apologized for not being there for me. I told him if he's truly sorry for not being there for me, he should make up for it by being there for me now. He told me he was going to try his best to be there for me and that he got a job in construction. I told him I was going into the army and he broke down in tears and told me he was proud of me. I couldn't help it but cry as well. It was a very emotional moment. I told him because he hasn't been there all my life, I'm not going to call him dad just because he's my biological dad. I'm going to call him by his name. If he wants me to call him dad, he has to earn that. 
He said that's fine. I plan on going back tomorrow and being there for a while. Of course it's going to be after he gets out of work. Update. I'm ready to go. I'm here at my biological father's house. My mom doesn't know I'm leaving for the army. The only thing she knows is that I moved out of her house and I'm staying with my biological father. I left a note telling her everything about how she's treated me except for the fact that I'm going into the army. I'm going to call an Uber to take me to the station where I'm going to get picked up by a bus and then take me to the army. My biological dad is paying for the Uber in case y'all are wondering. I don't know if my mom has read the letter yet because I'm not there to see her reaction. I did talk to my sister who's 10 about me moving out because I got a job. She said she was sad but she asked if I was going to come back and visit and I told her yes when I have the time. That's all for now. Thanks for everything. Thanks for listening to my pathetic life. I, 16 male, have a four-month-old daughter. Ex-girlfriend wants to go to college and I'm worried. My parents divorced when I was 10 but lived primarily with my mom. Tiffany, who's 16, her parents are together. When our parents found out she was pregnant, her parents kicked her out and my mom kicked me out. So now we live with my dad. During the pregnancy, my dad took my mom to court and got primary sole custody. I know what this means because I had to go to court for my daughter. He sued Tiffany's parents for legal guardianship and they are mad and refuse to talk to us. I'm in my bedroom and my daughter is in her bedroom and my ex is in the guest room that's now hers. My dad made a deal with us. We live with him until 18 with no rent payment. At 18, we need to decide what it is we're going to do. I wasn't really that good in school and Tiffany is an A student, so I took my GED and my dad got me into welding school. I finish in two months. I also work full time, so I do welding school at night. Tiffany goes to school and works on the weekends at Wendy's. This whole thing is a huge ordeal. We literally have no life. My dad helps, but not that much because he feels it's our responsibility, which I agree, but it still sucks. I work 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. at a warehouse and I go to school from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Tiffany is home by 2.30 and picks up our daughter from daycare. We help each other a lot and then I head off to school and she stays with her at home until I get home and do it all over again day after day. When our daughter was born, my dad made us go to court. We have 50-50 custody and I don't pay child support because she lives with us. Because I work full time, I can get health care for my daughter and myself and it sucks that it costs me $300 a month and daycare is $400 a week. Literally, Tiffany works just so we can pay for daycare and I pay for everything else. When we are short for cash, my dad will help because he sees that we're trying. My dad has been our rock. When we're tired and exhausted, he will step in and give us a break here and there, but he makes sure we have everything we need and keeps us motivated. Tiffany wants to apply to college soon and I'm worried because I don't want to keep living with her and I don't think I can keep our daughter full time as a welder working 12 hour shifts. But she says she will start a community college and work, but wants to stay with us living together since it's easier. Since I will be working and it will be best for us to stay with my dad. But my dad said at 18 we have to pay rent. She doesn't mind, but I don't want to keep living with her because we aren't together. I'm unsure how to tell her this. My dad thinks she should stay with us as long as she is a full-time student to finish her degree because I'm already getting my career. I just feel that all this is unfair because the burden is on me. I guess I'm ranting because I'm scared and unsure what all of this means. Edit. I guess my thing about her living with us is that we are more like siblings now. We get along and joke and stuff, but since she's my ex, I feel weirded out by it. Maybe I need to take a breather since everyone is saying it's a good thing. Also, I needed to hear it from other people and not just my dad. And he's pretty solid and I should thank him, maybe take him to dinner or something. Edit. My dad isn't kicking us out at 18, but he wants us to be realistic to the world and pay bills. The money he gets from Tiffany's parents, he just gives it to her. She's saving up money for a car and uses other money for her specific foods and clothes. Before I became a dad, my dad always wanted me to live with him at 18 and figure it out and stay with him and save money to buy a house. But when he found out I was going to be a dad, he wasn't mad but disappointed and said everything has to change. He also is paying for my welding school of 20000 and he bought me my car, but I do have to pay my own insurance. He does help as long as he sees that we're trying and not being lazy. When school recently started, he took my daughter to daycare every morning and helped Tiffany with a routine to get schoolwork done. Final edit. I have to get to class now. Tiffany wants to be a nurse or PA, 
but the college told her nursing school is hard to get into and it's best to have a high school diploma, which is why she's still in high school and working the weekends. But someone mentioned a dual thing for community college and we'll look into that. So we couldn't get daycare assistance because we're minors and they used my dad's salary. The funny thing is, I can't open a checkings account for myself because I'm a minor, but the bank allowed me to open a children's account for my daughter because I'm her parent. The irony. I read every single comment and it's given me a different point of view. And I guess college seems so far and I was counting years, but it's really not that bad. She's like a sister now. And those who asked, I doubt we'll be getting back together. Honestly, I'm not thinking about anything like that right now. I'm too tired to think of a relationship or that type of future. Update. Tiff and my dad went to the school and were able to get her enrolled in college courses because of her grades. She won't graduate high school way too fast, but she will have enough to finish high school hours by next December, so six months early. She reapplied for assistance. We got a voucher for daycare, so now it's $50 a week. She quit her job so she can focus on school, but she doesn't start college until spring, so that's cool, it gives her some time. She still wants to be a nurse, so that's cool too. I got a new job that pays more as a forklift operator and will give me an internship for welding, which I won't be able to start until November, but they're paying me really good. I started Monday. My dad and I had a long talk about my fears and he reassured me that it's okay to be scared, but we have to have a game plan. He's fixing up the basement to make two bedrooms and a living room, like a little apartment, because he said Tiff and I will need space as we grow. He wants me to buy the house when I'm 18, like he did with his parents, and he will help me pay it as long as Tiff gets to stay until she finishes college and let her make her own choice. We all agreed this is the best option, and we're all already much happier now. I guess I just needed to let it out. Tiff and I are great while being parents is hard, but it's now been good and we're feeling better. My mom and Tiff's parents still haven't spoken to us because we aren't married, which does make me sad, but it's okay, we have my dad. Am I the jerk for refusing to bleach my hair for a wedding? So I have a weird problem, and after I told my boyfriend, he told me this sub would be the perfect place to get help on it. So I, 25 female, am meant to be in the bridal party of my friend Zoe's, who's 26, wedding in December of 2024. A few days ago, she met with me and the rest of the bridal party to discuss what the plan was for hair, makeup, dresses, etc. At first, it seemed reasonable. She's going for a winter wonderland type of theme, so blue dresses, all in different shades, lined up as a gradient, with silvery accents, snowflake jewelry, and soft makeup. Even blue contacts for those of us without blue eyes. Last one's a bit weird, but it's no big deal to me. I've worn color contacts for Halloween. The bit that ended up being an issue for me is that Zoe requested we all get our hair dyed. A couple members of the bridal group are natural blondes with dyed ends, and so is Zoe, but she wants to go platinum for the wedding. But the rest of us are two brunettes, a strawberry blonde, and a redhead. I'm one of the brunettes, and I'm the only one in the group who has never dyed or bleached their hair. I've considered it, but I can never stay settled on what I want to do, and I'd hate to spend money on something that I end up hating. On top of that, my mom spent from ages 5 to 13 flat ironing my hair almost every day. It really damaged my hair. I'm almost certain that it's resulted in my hair being thinner than it used to be. I know bleaching can also damage your hair and I don't feel comfortable taking that risk. I told Zoe I wouldn't be able to dye my hair. She insisted that it would be fine as my hair seemed quite healthy and she would be paying for the bleaching treatments for all of us. I again said no, thanks so much, but I can't. I asked if I could just wear a wig and she said no, that wigs are cheap and unnatural and she wants us to have our real hair bleached instead of some cheap imitation for the day. After more back and forth, she told me I should go home and think about the fact that I'm ruining her vision and that I'd be ruining the photos and wedding video that she and her fiancé will be putting together for his grandparents. I apologized, paid for my meal, and I left. I really don't want to dye my hair, but I also don't want to ruin Zoe's perfect day. I don't think I'm being difficult or wrong here, but am I? My coworker brings her dog to work. She was asked to stop after a few incidents, so she wrote us a crazy four-page memo. I live in a small town and started working as a night auditor in a hotel a few months back. I rarely ever interact with other employees, let alone the guests. I enjoy it. Lots of time to read and mess around on Reddit. Recently, due to several wildfires and the mandatory evacuations they've created, we've had an influx of long-stay guests who have lost their homes. We also have several fire crews in-house, which has been fun. No sarcasm there. They're great. The issue, however, is this. The other night auditor brings her dog to work. It is not a service animal. 
While the hotel is pet friendly, she's been asked to stop bringing her pet in with her. She has ignored these requests. Recently, we've been getting complaints. Her dog has chased people through the building, attempted to bite guests, attack them, and fight other dogs. In response to these complaints, she started locking her dog in the guest dining area and kitchen. Her dog has been going to the bathroom in the kitchen, which is an issue. When our boss has finally put the boot down and told her no more pets, she wrote a four-page memo about the issue. Short version, she admitted that her dog had done everything stated above, but the reason people were complaining was because of the Illuminati's plot against her and her pet. I wish I was kidding. Here's the memo, in all of its glory. I've redacted identifying names, including the dog's name. Communication Post, September 8, 2022. At this time, it would be best practice to leave all employee pets at home due to several complaints and concerns from guests. While we understand that we know and love the pets of staff members, we cannot possibly tolerate pets being aggressive to guests. September 16, 2022. Dear staff, this letter is in response to the comments above, which was posted in the communication log on September 8th. If you have any comments, please feel free to post them at the bottom of this letter. A bit of background about my dog, my canine companion. She is one year old and has been with me at this hotel since she was eight weeks old. Together, she and I are the night auditors. It's worked out well because she stays awake with me during the shift and we both sleep during the day. She likes all of the front desk staff and gets excited when it's time to come to work so she can greet them and begin her shift. So far, she likes this person and this person the best, possibly because they've made her feel welcome and they're kind to her. Many of the guests also like her and she has received many compliments from them. She has gone through various stages of development and growth and presently she's at the stage of finding her voice and honing her socialization skills in a public setting. She and I eat a plant-based diet to teach her non-violence and harmlessness. Her food is scientifically fortified, which I have to purchase online from a specialty company in order for her to take in all of the necessary nutrients to keep her strong and healthy in body, mind, and spirit. I take her training seriously, and the ultimate goal is for her to be peaceful, calm, socialized, and comfortable with all. So far, she sees the hotel as her house, and is presently working on understanding that it's okay that other people besides the staff members may come and go through the front door. She barks to announce the arrival of people she doesn't know, and therefore I keep her gated, behind the desk when guests are circulating about. She does not bark behind the desk. In time, I feel she will relax more and more. When everyone has gone to sleep and it's quiet in the hotel, I allow her to play with her toys in the lobby area and she likes to follow me into the laundry room, etc. while I go about my cleaning duties. Her socialization training is something we diligently work on and there's still room for improvement in this area. The other night, Redacted informed me that two guests approached her on September 8th and yelled at her about something. Apparently, the guest stated that my dog barked at them. It's possible that my dog barked at them, as stated. However, I can't recall who this is or verify this because neither of these people approached me about the issue or came to the desk to speak with me directly. I apologize again for this, as I know it doesn't feel good to be on the receiving end of a complaint or when someone unloads on us. It was also brought to my attention from a different staff member that the man named Redacted, who stayed with us on August 31st, complained to the front desk that my dog barked at him and chased him down the hall. This I can verify to be true. It was after hours, quiet in the hotel, and she was following me around while I cleaned. Mr. Redacted unexpectedly walked down the hall and it startled her, but she also chased after him as he walked away and expressed her disapproval of him. I redirected her immediately and apologized on her behalf. Gee, maybe this is why you shouldn't have your dog with you at work. A bit later, the lobby and the hotel were quiet again. No one was around and so I allowed her to play with her toys in the lobby area. It goes without saying that the lobby is a public area and the guests should always feel comfortable coming and going as they like, but Mr. Redacted was making his presence known deliberately to rouse my dog and walk through the lobby several times in the wee hours of the morning to go smoke in front of the building. I finally realized that he was doing this purposely to harass her and I put her in the other room with the door shut. His response was to yell at her and the following morning he reported the incident to the front desk and was rewarded a free night stay at the hotel due to his complaint. Adding here that Mr. Redacted was charged a cleaning fee 
Due to housekeeping, finding towels and sheets that were filthy and everything had to be thrown away. He's a troubled man, and while we can't hold compassion for him, I don't recommend he be allowed back at this hotel. As stated above, there is room for improvement with my dog's socialization skills, which she and I are dedicated towards making her a success. It is important that she behaves properly and like a nice young lady while she is here. She's a loving, funny, and loyal little being, and it is a blessing that she is here on planet Earth. She's helped me to tolerate the grave shift hours too, with her excellent company and companionship she provides. I'm now going to explain something that may seem strange, but it is necessary to add this, because it is the truth, and it relates to what happened with the complaints against my dog. Some of you are already aware that my second job is light working. I am a light worker for Planetary Ascension. Recently, I completed some work to shine light upon the reptilian negative alien races who are present on this earth plane and who are behind organized crime. The reptilians have demonstrated vicious behaviors and they are very dangerous towards humans and animals. This information about their presence has been kept from mainstream society. However, things are heating up planet-wide and a full disclosure event will be taking place in the near future. I've studied these alien races since 2015 and I am acutely familiar with their attacks against those of us who stand up for the light and shine light upon their darkness. The recent complaint against my dog was a deliberate and planned attack against me. The reptilians targeted my dog and used the situation to get back at me, to retaliate because of my recent work in calling out their crimes. My contact with the authorities was on the same day, August 31st, that Mr. Redacted made his appearance and the other two complaints came afterwards for three in a row. Noting that the reptilians are reading this post as they are able to track, spy, and interfere via advanced technology through television, computers, cell phones, and other devices. Therefore, I am letting them know that God is my witness, and I will assist in standing up for those who have no voice. To recap, under normal circumstances, and especially at a hotel which allows dogs, if a dog barks at someone, Normally, the person would shrug it off as long as it doesn't continue, which it didn't. I redirect my dog each time and lovingly encourage her to be peaceful and calm. She also has never nipped at anyone. Her barking is instinctive and with time it will ease up, and I feel confident that she will be more at ease as she gets through this growth stage. Also, my dog is absolutely heartbroken that I've left her at home. I'm keeping her at home for a few weeks to work more intensely on her training and plan on using a vibrating bark collar to better get her attention. Her time away from the hotel will allow the tension from the dark forces to settle too. When I feel she has improved with her barking and listening skills, I plan on bringing her back to work with me. Thanks for listening and for keeping an open mind and an open heart. Well, I guess now is as good a time as any to tell you all that I am Karen Akatosh of the Galactic Federation of Light, sent here by the Ashtar Command from the Pleiadian system. I am here to spread love and light and to fight the Draconian- Karen? Yes? Shut up. <coughs> Karen just drops off her baby at my apartment and demands that I babysit for her. I, female 24, am an aunt to my one-year-old niece, Ava. My sister and brother-in-law live close to me, so I babysit for them sometimes. They don't pay me, but I'm happy to do it anyway. On Friday was their anniversary, and they asked me three weeks in advance if I could babysit. I provisionally agreed because I had nothing else planned. My plans changed, however, when some of my old college friends told me they were stopping by my town on Friday. I haven't seen them in nearly three years, and I really wanted to see them. I gave my sister five days' notice that I could no longer babysit on Friday, and that she would have to make other arrangements. She didn't respond to the text, but she read it, so I assumed that it was okay. On Friday, however, sister stopped by my house with Ava. I was confused and asked why she was here. She told me she was leaving Ava with me as originally planned. I said again I was busy. She replied that family is more important than my silly college friends, and I should step up to my responsibility as an aunt. Before I could protest, she bolted back to her car where brother-in-law was and they drove off, leaving Ava with me. I tried to call her after she left, but she had her phone off and none of my calls went through. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't leave Ava alone, but I also didn't want to cancel my plans. There's no other family members who live near me. However, I do have a friend, Jade, who lives near. She's good with kids and does babysitting as a side hustle. 
I called her and explained the situation, even offering to pay her to look after Ava, but she was understanding and said she'd do it for free. I thanked her profusely and dropped Ava off. I texted my sister to say I had left Ava with Jade and to collect her from her house. It's relevant to the story that neither sister nor Ava know Jade personally. My sister didn't respond immediately, but after about two hours, she started spamming my phone. I turned my phone off as I was already out by that point anyway. They picked up Ava later that evening and she was perfectly happy. However, my sister and brother-in-law are furious at me for dumping Ava with a stranger, even though they know Jade is a trusted friend of mine. They accused me of endangering my own niece. Many other family members are sided with them and I've been getting angry texts all weekend. I really don't know what to think. I feel like I acted as best I could given the circumstances. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Yes, your sister asked you three weeks in advance, but five days is plenty of warning that you wanted to change plans. The fact she didn't call you back or try to negotiate with you and just dropped your niece off and ran isn't funny or cute. She's the parent, and her kid is her and her husband's responsibility, not yours. Welcome to parenthood. She seems to be confused on this point. You don't owe her free babysitting at all. Her antics of drop and dash and then using other family as flying monkeys to guilt trip you are childish, selfish, and disrespectful. So, for the foreseeable future, no matter what, when she asks you to babysit, tell her no. Make her reach out to other mommy friends, get into a babysitter coop, or her husband's family or friends can step up. Only offer to take your niece when you want to see her at your convenience, or be available as a sitter in a true emergency, like a hospital or funeral home is involved. But other than that, she needs boundaries and consequences for her crap. Give them to her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. Sometimes entitled parents need to learn the hard way. If an entitled parent is furious with you over a decision you made, you probably did the right thing. My fiancé is demanding I put her name on my house. She's still my fiancé right now, but the argument we're having is that once we're married, she wants her name on the house deed. Years ago, I bought several acres as soon as I could afford it. Back then, it was part of a ranch surrounded by other ranches. The owner needed money, so he parceled out this section and he sold it to me. I built a small house on it and I've lived here ever since. Since it was originally part of a ranch, I did enough legally to keep it classified as a ranch, so the property tax is extremely low. Over the years, companies started to move to the neighboring big city and land prices really started going up. Almost all of the ranchers sold their lands to developers, so now there are huge houses surrounding mine. They start from $500,000 and they go to several million. None of them sit on even an acre of land. My house is clearly the worst house around and I have no doubt it's bringing the value of the nearby houses down. That all happened before I met and even dated my fiancé. Now that we're engaged, we're talking seriously about our finances and the only sticking point is the house. She wants her name on the deed once we're married because we'll be sharing our lives. Alternatively, she wants me to sell the house and we purchase a house together. I don't find either options attractive. In our state, whatever we bring to the marriage, we take out. Since I will be bringing the house into the marriage, I can leave with it should things not work out. If I put her name on it, then she'll get half. If I sell the house, there's no way I'll be able to afford anything that's even close to what I have now. Not to mention, our property tax will be several times higher. Then there's the drive time. My house is 30 minutes away from my work and 40 minutes from hers. House prices have gone up so much that we'll have to move at least an hour away from our jobs. Like I said, we agreed with or compromised on everything else. This one issue is the only sticking point and it's becoming a big one. So much so that she brought her family into it. This weekend, her father took me out to dinner to have a man-to-man -man talk with me. He told me that if we're going to join our lives, we have to join everything. He expects me to do the right thing if I want to join their family. So now it's her entire family on one side and me by myself on the other. Am I wrong to want to keep the house I built by myself to myself? Edit. Neither of us are rich. I bought the land at a very low price, but now it's worth 10 times as much. Even if I offer to sell half of it to her at its current value, there's no way she can afford it. That's why if we buy a house together, we'll have to move far away from here and our jobs in order to get one we can both afford. In all, I spent about $200,000 to buy the land and build the house. Everything is paid off and I pay the extremely low taxes every year. The tax assessment on my property is about $2 million. I don't know anything about refinancing, 
But at our salary level, I doubt we would qualify. In fact, we've spoken to a real estate agent and with a 20% down, our salary qualifies us for a $300,000 house. The property tax on a $300,000 house is many times the current tax I pay now. I'm comfortable with us living in my house and paying all the taxes and maintenance by myself. Many are asking about my compromise and pointing out her lack of financial security. My compromise is that we live in my house and I'll pay for all of the taxes, bills, and maintenance. Based on our conversation with the real estate agent, if we buy a $300,000 house, her half of the mortgage would be about $1,300, not including her half of the property tax and down payment. I pointed out to her that if I pay for everything towards my current house, she would be saving at least $15,600 a year over the 30 years on the mortgage alone. That doesn't include the money she would be saving, not paying the down payment and property tax. In my mind, that would give her plenty of financial freedom and security. Also, if I sell the land, I don't want to buy any new house outright with that money. The reason we went to see a real estate agent is that if we buy a house together, I want it to be something we can both afford. Mortgage, down payment, taxes. I would put any money that I make off this sale into the retirement account. That's the main reason why I haven't sold my land despite many developers begging me to. Yes, some actually begged me. I view it as my retirement investment. You're not wrong, but neither is she. You have to find a compromise. That said, she made a huge mistake by bringing her family into it and having her father personally discuss the issue with you. She showed that she doesn't regard you as an equal partner and that she believes in bullying you into getting what she wants. The only acceptable solution here would be to consult a financial advisor for options and to discuss this between you two to find a solution. Her discussing this with her family was a mistake. Her father discussing this directly with you is a deal breaker type of mistake. Neither she nor he seemed to understand how much of a massive overstep that was. Would you think it's okay that your in-laws weigh in on your childbearing decisions? One thought with regard to a solution is to have a legal document drawn up that requires you to pay her half of the net value from month of marriage to month of transfer. She deserves something for living there as her home for 20 years if that's what happens. Since she didn't invest the money in the first place, I see your point of the current value solely being yours and not hers, but from the point of marriage on, she will be investing in the property. That makes it collectively both of yours. Have an appraisal done and you should be good to go. Bear in mind, I think you have a larger issue than just this property ownership. Not the jerk. The biggest red flag is how she's dealing with this. Instead of working out with you, she's going to her mommy and daddy and sending her flying monkeys to deal with it. This is how every issue is going to be dealt with. Every disagreement is going to be her whole family against you every time. I don't think any of them have your best interests or even your well-being at heart, and I have no doubt that if the roles were reversed, you'd be having dinner with her father explaining how you need to do the right thing and not expect half. Not saying break up with her, just pointing out serious red flags. The fact is, if she isn't planning on breaking up, she wouldn't need to demand half. She's planning for her future post-divorce life. You should do the same. Not the jerk. Your house is a premarital asset. Protect it as such. Hire a lawyer to draft a prenup. Do not put her name on the deed. She didn't contribute anything to it, and her dad has no business getting involved. Tell him that, using his own analogy, that you should be on their deed in bank accounts too. You'll regret it when she divorces you and takes half the value of your home. Well, what do you think? Should OP put his fiance's name on his house or not? Please let us know. It always amazes me how some people feel entitled to things that they didn't work for. It just makes me mad. Well, if they didn't exist, we wouldn't have half the stories we read, Karen. Final update. Am I the jerk for not accepting my sister's relationship with my ex despite her having cancer as a teen? I'm 25, female. My stepsister is 23. My father married her mother when I was four and she was three. We've lived together most of our lives and we're a family. She and I were extremely close. She developed cancer when she was 14 and was sick for about two years. She's since made a full recovery. During that time, my parents became understandably overprotective. They also asked a lot of me. I quit my extracurriculars so I could get a job. The money went towards her medical bills and so I could drive her to appointments. I didn't go to dances and any fun activities I did needed to include her. I did almost all of this willingly, the exception being having to quit my high school volleyball team. I did throw a bit of a tantrum about that but was swiftly punished. And I think having one emotional breakdown was pretty chill given the circumstances. Anyhow, I go to college and meet my ex, we'll call him Ben, when I'm a junior. We fall in love, blah blah blah. He and I move in together when we graduate, 
so we've been living together for about three years. We were serious until July when I walked into my room and I saw him and her hooking up. I broke it off. Tears were shed. He moved out, etc. My sister apologized at first, but then backed off. I thought she was giving me space, but last week she called and asked if we could meet up. She told me that she and Ben were in love and were just telling me as a courtesy before they started posting photos online. Distraught, I left her in the restaurant by herself and did not pay my portion of the bill. She later Venmoed me asking for the money. She told my parents, who then called me to their house, telling me how disappointed in me they are for not supporting my sister's relationship with Ben. They brought up the fact that because she had cancer as a teen, she never learned proper social etiquette and has a hard time meeting people. I don't buy this, in part because I've seen her socialize just fine, and since we spent a good chunk of the time she was sick together, that would also mean that I should have bad social skills as well, by that logic. They then told me that if I don't accept my sister and Ben's relationship, they may have to go no contact with me. I reminded them that I'm also their daughter and they should understand my point of view, but they're adamant that this is about me being jealous of her. For the record, I'm not jealous of her. I'm not upset that Ben picked her over me. I'm sad about the end of the relationship and I do feel betrayed, but Lord knows that I don't want to be with a cheater. What I'm upset about is the fact that my sister chose Ben over me, that she hooked up with Ben knowing he and I were in a long-term committed relationship and continues to be with him knowing how much it hurts me. Now, no one in my immediate family is talking to me and I'm getting messages from aunts and uncles and cousins telling me that I'm a jerk and that I'm selfish. Update. I got in touch with my sister and asked her to meet up again at a park. No bill involved. I asked her if she was pregnant and she told me the truth. She said she wanted us to still be in each other's lives and that she wanted me to be in her baby's life. Someone on Reddit mentioned that she may ask me to be the godmother and that person was correct. But as many of you pointed out, if I didn't cut her off, I'd just become her bank and daycare employee. So I told her I could no longer be in her life, and I left her crying on a park bench, and I felt like the worst person in the world. I emailed my parents and told them how betrayed I felt, and that I'd be cutting off contact with them. To my stepmom's credit, she apologized. She explained that she never thought my sister would live to have kids, and that she let her emotions over that get the better of her. Understandable. My dad said nothing, which is honestly what sucked the worst about all of this. Ben tried messaging me from a burner account for the first time since the breakup, but I blocked him without reading it. I didn't go nuclear and post the story to Facebook as some suggested, but I sent an email to the extended family members who I care about. I explained the situation and how I'd be distancing myself from my family. Some have made it an us versus them situation, and as much as I appreciate the support, feeling like I'm in some valiant battle just makes me more tired so I haven't been talking to much of anyone in my family. I feel lonely and crappy, but I think I made the right decision. Update. Since I found out about the pregnancy, he's tried to get in touch with me six times through email, text, and burner accounts, has tried to get mutual friends to talk to me for him, has showed up to my place once. The latter was the only time I humored him. He told me he was sorry, he loves me, he doesn't want to be with my stepsister, and he wants to get back together with me. I told him, tough. He made his bed, now he gets to lay in it with her. I haven't dated much since July because of my life's implosion, but in November, a friend from college messaged me out of the blue. We hadn't talked in a long time. He, 27, male, referred to as X2 for the rest of this post, and X1 were good friends but had a falling out over something fantasy football related the year after we graduated and I stopped talking to him out of solidarity or whatever. Anyhow, we go on a date, we click, we go on a few more dates. We become exclusive in early December. I was feeling really hopeful about this until this morning. I was supposed to meet X2 at a New Year's party last night. He got there before I left the house and texted me saying that X1 was at the party and asked whether I still wanted to come. I declined and went to another friend's house and I have a pretty good time there. I tried calling X2 at midnight but he didn't pick up. I didn't think much about it. Anyhow, I go to bed late and when I wake up this morning, I have a message from X2 saying we're done. I couldn't even respond because he had blocked me everywhere. I talked to a friend who was at the party the exes were at last night, and he said the two of them had spent a good chunk of time chatting with each other, but he didn't know what they were talking about. I'm not close with anyone else who was at the party, so I don't really have anyone else to ask. It was just a two-month relationship. I'm sad, but I'm okay. But the paranoid part of my mind is really concerned that X1 said something that resulted in X2 becoming X2. 
X2 has made it abundantly apparent that he doesn't want to talk to me again, and I don't want to push that boundary, but I'm so confused. I could contact X1, but I get the feeling that will open a floodgate of drama. I could also try talking to other mutual friends to see if they've heard anything, but I also don't really want to spread this as a rumor if it isn't true. I don't know, I'm at a loss. Any advice here? I'm spiraling, thinking that my ex is going to try to ruin every relationship I have for the rest of my life. Update. Turns out he met someone at the New Year's party and hooked up with her. Instead of telling me, he just blocked me everywhere and sent a lackey to message me a few weeks later with the real story and a weak apology. I want to be angry and maybe part of me is, but as I'm sitting here, I'm just thinking, what if it's me? What if I'm just not lovable? What if it's never going to happen for me? Dad didn't approve of my career choice, so I got promoted and took his money. I've worked for the same restaurant chain since I was legally allowed to work at 16. At first, it was just a part-time job to make money while in high school. At 18, I ended up transferring to a location a few hours away where I was going to college and I got promoted to supervisor. After a semester, I ended up dropping out of school due to the effects it was having on my mental health. I've never been very motivated by money, just want to pay my bills and have a simple life with good friends and family nearby. So I decided to stick with this company and continue to work my way up until I could manage my own location. Ever since I dropped out of college though, my dad took every opportunity to try and persuade me to do something more serious with my life. He's always been very motivated by money, so it's hard for him to understand why I don't feel the same way, which I could understand to some extent. But after two years of every single conversation with my dad ending in an argument over my career choice, it had heavily impacted our relationship. It's very demanding being constantly reminded that you're wasting your life or not being responsible, even though I was in my own apartment with my own car at just 18 years old. We didn't have a healthy relationship to begin with, so this added disagreement just made me even more resentful. So one day I finally had the opportunity to move out of state where a lot of my extended family lived, along with being promoted to assistant manager at this new location. When I told my dad this, he begged me to look for another job. He said he was embarrassed by my profession and wished he could post about my accomplishments like my siblings. He ended up offering me $2,000 if I found a job that would pay me $14 an hour or more. Generous, yes, but I'd rather have a dad who supports me or at least doesn't belittle me, you know? Anyway, I texted the manager I had been in contact with about my transfer to ask if we could discuss my pay. I convinced her to increase the offer from $13.75 to $14.25. I told my dad I had gotten an offer for more than $14 and asked for the $2,000 as it was time for me to put down my deposit and first month's rent for my new apartment. He said he would eventually, but that technically he never clarified when he would pay me. He had plenty of money, but was always stingy with it. I told him I'd just ask my grandma for a loan since he wasn't following through and I'd use his money to pay her back eventually. Of course, he didn't want our family to know that he was being a jerk, so he sent me the money. Afterwards, he asked me about my new job, to which I said, I'm not getting a new job, I'm just getting a raise. I could hear the steam coming out of his ears over the phone. He started yelling and demanding I send back the money, but I told him, well, you're right, you never clarified when you'd have to pay up, but you also never clarified that the wage I needed had to come from a different job. I hung up and kept the money. We didn't talk for a while and still hardly talk now. Edit. A lot of you seem very concerned about the wage, which I understand as I didn't clarify when or where this took place. This was about eight years ago and for the area, $14.25 for assistant manager was a decent wage. Not great, but paid my bills and allowed me to save as well. As for my current profession, I took a temporary leave of absence to help my mom care for my stepdad who's currently in physical rehabilitation. I'll be returning to work in October. And don't worry, I'm a manager now, and I make about twice as much as I did as assistant manager eight years ago. Might not feel like success to others, but my bills are paid. I have a good savings account, and I've met some of my best friends at this job, so I'm happy. Lastly, as I stated in one of my comments, my dad was neglectful when I was growing up. So no, I do not regret taking his money and damaging our relationship, as it was already beyond recovery for me. Edit 2. I should have worded the grandma part differently. To clarify, I planned on moving to be near my extended family before my dad even offered me the deal. I had the money for the deposit and rent. When I said I reached out because it was time for me to pay the deposit, I only meant that's what initiated the phone call. Obviously, I'd rather use the 2000 than my own savings. 
I wasn't actually going to ask my grandma for a loan because I didn't need to. I only said that because I knew my dad didn't want his mom to know he went back on his word, and I was right. Now for everyone assuming my dad paid for my expenses, I worked under the table job since I was in middle school because I was responsible for purchasing all of my food, clothes, and hygiene products. He provided a roof over my head, and that's about it. The only money he has ever given me is that $2,000 which he tried to refuse to give me even before he knew I was keeping the same job. It's all about control, and anyone else with a narcissistic parent will understand. My main takeaway is that pay is way too low. Having to ask to get over 14 an hour as an assistant manager? That's a sorry state. I'm sorry your dad's a jerk. He should have been proud of you for pulling that off on him. Man, OP, you suck. I'll probably get downvoted into oblivion, but here goes. Your entire post is centered on yourself. You display no humility or awareness of others, and you are boastful about several things that make me cringe. You say your relationship wasn't healthy to begin with, but that's pretty standard when you're a teenager. You call him belittling without any supporting events to back it up, and you try to paint him as unsupportive for wanting you to get a different job, even going so far as to financially incentivize it with a cash bonus if you get a job that increases your hourly pay. You talk about dropping out of college because of the effects on your mental health, like what? Stress? You think it gets easier away from school? Not saying that college is the right decision for you, but dropping out is the first in a line of several short-sighted and immature decisions you admit to. You seem proud of having your own place and your own car at 18. While those are responsibilities, having them does not make you responsible. If your car is on a lease and you can barely afford your apartment, that wouldn't be a responsible circumstance. If you owned both and spent all your free time partying or playing video games or posting on Reddit, still not responsible. You say you aren't financially motivated like him, which probably is something you feel proud about. However, you were financially motivated enough by a $2,000 bonus to do something about it. So if it hasn't occurred to you, you're actually wrong about your not like him belief. You negotiated a raise from your boss to get that bonus. I hope you're aware that raise comes out to $20 more per week and that's before taxes. Assuming a typical tax situation, you conned your dad and mistreated that relationship for about $16 a week. Congrats, you get a supersized meal deal at a fast food place for dinner one extra time. You suggested and threatened to go to your grandma for a loan. Leaving aside the fact that you needed financial help because $14.25 an hour ain't exactly responsible and independent money, you were going to use a grandparent's generosity. And even if that was only a tactic, you were manipulating your dad into giving you money. What a selfish and petulant choice. You say he has plenty of money, but was always stingy with it. Guess what? Your description of him makes it seem like he works for it, not you. Your sense of entitlement is bonkers. It's disgusting. Am I the jerk for calling my daughter a private school snob? My daughter, Ella, who's 26, is a doctor. She works very hard and is very talented. She spent most of her life with her mother, but took up a position at a hospital near me, and so she moved in with me. She doesn't own a car at the moment, but I've insured her to drive mine so she can use it to get to work. Ella worked a lot of continuous 12-hour shifts and finally got a day off today. She's pretty exhausted but had an errand to run. She ordered a new pair of designer trainers, but neither of us were at home when they arrived, so they were left at a delivery center nearby for her to collect. There's a bus stop about 5 minutes walk from my house and that bus stops right outside the delivery center. It's about a 20-minute journey. Ella asked if she could borrow the car to pick up the shoes. I said no. I only use the car to get to work, if I'm carrying a lot of things. I don't use the car for anywhere that's walking distance or a short journey on public transport. Ella got upset and argued that she's been on her feet all day for several days and is too tired. She then said that she's not the sort of person who uses public transport. Her mother and their family are extremely well off. Ella went to a very prestigious private school. Unfortunately, they also have certain attitudes towards people not as fortunate, one of which is that public transport is used by unsuccessful people. When she said that about not being the sort of person who uses it, I said that she needs to get that snooby private school attitude out of her head if she wants to get anywhere in life. She lost it on me and stormed off, but did end up going on the bus to get the shoes. While she was gone, Ella's mother called me, shouting at me for making our daughter's life difficult and accusing me of trying to hold her back, etc. She said I should show that I care, that she's worked so hard at the hospital. I accept that I shouldn't have said the private school comment, but Ella isn't so tired she can't brave a five-minute walk to the bus stop. 
I don't want her to be reliant on the car when there are other ways to get where she needs to go. Am I the jerk? Everyone sucks here. Her for the not the sort of person who uses public transport comment and you for not allowing her to take the car after a 12 hour shift. Is it an environmental thing or a cost thing with you? Calling 50-50 on this one because given someone just worked a 12 hour shift at a hospital helping others, you don't really get to dictate how tired they are and justify it off your personal metric of tiredness. If someone said they just finished 12 hours at a hospital, I'd be more inclined to just make their life easier. You're the jerk. That's an awful way to speak to your own kid. You're pretty clear that you blame her mother for these attitudes, but you didn't bother doing much about bringing her up properly yourself with a better attitude to less wealthy people, so, you know. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his daughter? Please let us know. Dude, just let her use the car, bro. Like, what are cars for? My new Karen neighbor is demanding I cut down plants in my yard. A family that has kids recently moved into the house next door. The border between our yards, mostly on my side, has a ton of poison ivy. I'm extremely sensitive to it, so I haven't tried to control it except when it starts to grow too much into my yard. Even when I do remove it, I have to suit up and wash everything thoroughly, and I still somehow end up with a rash. One of the parents came to my door last week to ask me to remove the poison ivy because their kids have been getting rashes when they play in that part of the yard. I said that I couldn't do that because of my sensitivity, but that they could just get it removed on their side and as long as their kids stayed in their own yard, it wouldn't be an issue. They said that even if they did that, it would grow back into their yard from my side and that I could pay a company to remove it if I wouldn't do it myself. I said that I would only agree to it if they paid for all of it. They refused and said that they would be looking into local laws about nuisance plants. We're not on speaking terms anymore. Am I really the jerk here? It's their problem, so why should I have to pay for it? They could just teach their kids to avoid poison ivy like I do. I could understand if I had planted it intentionally, but poison ivy is a native plant that was here before I was, and it's an important food source for bees and birds. Quite frankly, I'm grateful for it, because it's been keeping their loud kids away from my yard who were really annoying me whenever I was out in my garden. It sounds like the poison ivy border between your properties is a nuisance to both you and your neighbors, and you are all making this situation needlessly complicated. Why not just hire a company to remove the plant and then split the cost? Edit. Oh, I see that the real reason you're letting this poisonous plant continue to grow and encroach on your neighbor's property is so that their kids will not be able to play in that section of their own yard. You are intentionally keeping a poisonous plant around that's harmful to both you and your neighbors so that they can't access that part of their property. How completely selfish. You're the jerk. Info. Why aren't you two just paying half each? It's clearly a nuisance to both of you. I'm a little bothered on OP's behalf that the parent's response was to put the financial responsibility on OP. The verbiage used in the post, at least, comes across that the parent has deemed OP responsible for the removal whether it's professional or not. If OP doesn't care about it and appreciates it as both a contributor to the ecosystem and as a natural fence line, then it seems more reasonable for the parents to remove it on their side and put up either a competing bush or a hedge plant or put in garden edging of some kind or even a proper fence. A lot of people are crying, think of the kids, but that's really a point of education. Don't play near potentially harmful areas. There isn't going to be an easy answer to everything in life nor is everyone going to be willing to compromise. Additionally, if a kid is allergic to pollen or a particular tree, there's no exception that the neighborhood has to accommodate that. Trees are not poison ivy, but it's a loose connection given plants are the primary topic. As far as looking into nuisance laws for plants, my unprofessional assumption is that if OP isn't cultivating the plant and it's not an invasive species, it probably won't hold much weight as an argument. Then again, tree law is nuts, so I could be very incorrect there. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the neighbor? Please let us know. Roundup makes a special product just for poison ivy. It works like a charm. Spray the whole area and it'll be gone in a week. Am I the jerk for making my chronically late friend miss her seminar? My friend, 25 female, is constantly late for everything. Be it work-related or fun activities, she will always be at least 15 to 20 minutes late. She doesn't have a car, and so oftentimes I, 25 male, will have to pick her up from her house. I work at a university and she's a PhD student there and her place is along the way from me. Last time I offered her a ride to work, she ended up being 20 minutes late after I've already arrived at her place. 
Because of that, I ended up being late for work. She's always very apologetic about her lateness, but never changes. This week, she was supposed to give a seminar at the university, which is a crucial part of her PhD program. She asked me if I could give her a ride to work that day. I told her, sure, but that I was picking her up at 8 a.m. and she must be there at exactly 8 a.m. and not a minute later. She chuckled, but I told her I wasn't joking, and she promised that she would be there. The morning of her seminar, I drove to her place and I got there at 7.55 and texted her that I was here, and she told me that she would be out in just a minute. At 8 o'clock, there was no indication that she would come out, and she didn't text anything. So at 8.01, I drove off. At around 8.20, she called me asking where I was. I told her I was at work and that I wasn't joking when I told her that she had to be ready right that minute. She started screaming and crying over the phone and told me that she was having a hard time that morning, couldn't be ready right at 8 a.m. She then begged me to come back to pick her up as her seminar is at 9 a.m. and she needed to be at the school before then. I could have done it quick enough to pick her up and drop her off without affecting my work, but I decided I didn't want to do that and I told her that I wouldn't. She was crying and hyperventilating at that point and said she had promised to never be late for anything else again and re-emphasized that this seminar was crucial for her PhD and that she absolutely cannot miss it without severe consequence. I responded, oh well, and hung up. I then went about my day at work normally. I feel like I could have went back and picked her up in this scenario since it wouldn't have been detrimental to me and at the same time, this was something very important for her. On the other hand, I feel like this should be a wake-up call for her chronic lateness. Not the jerk. You warned her. She also had 40 minutes to make other arrangements, even after all her procrastination. Could you have been kinder? Yes. Could you have reminded her about your time restrictions? Yes. Could you have given her a final notice with an, I'm going to drive away at 8 o'clock? Yes. Is it rude to be continually late? Yes. Is she an adult? Yes. Is it your problem to manage her time? No. Still not the jerk. When you said you left at 8.01, I was thinking you were the jerk. But when she didn't call you until 8.20, I laughed and thought, oh no, definitely not the jerk. Your friend needs to learn that punctuality in the professional world is important. Also, her chronic lateness should not be affecting you getting to work on time. Not the jerk. I had a friend like this. I was left at the movies, restaurants, train stations. She was never, ever on time. Always apologetic, etc. Finally, I just started leaving after 15 minutes, which even that seemed a long time when you're waiting at a restaurant. I was also told after I left the first time, I'll never be late again, I promise. But she was. And then the friendship faded away, which was okay by me. My stomach was always in knots, and I was always frustrated and angry by the time she showed up that I finally realized I wasn't enjoying myself. Clearly, your friend showed up at 8.20 and expected you to idly wait for her like her chauffeur. It's so disrespectful of your time. Frankly, I'd be okay with not having this friend. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their friend? Please let us know. I don't mind at all when people show up late. It shows me that our time together is not important to them and I don't need to keep them in my life. You want me to coerce an inspector after someone else did the work? This happened years ago. I had just started working as an independent electrician and one day I received a call from a new customer. He was one of those people that flips homes in lower income neighborhoods. I'll call him Todd, but honestly, I've forgotten what his name is. Todd asked me to meet him at a vacant house he recently bought to give him an estimate for a full rewiring job. He was 30 minutes late, so I was already unimpressed with him. Upon entering the house, which was right after a rainstorm had passed through, we found an inch of water covering the hardwood floors. There was water pouring out of small holes in the column on the front porch. Everything was soaked. Instead of showing me around, Todd called his business partner and brother and spent the next 20 minutes going off on him for not fixing the roof. I'm standing around and listening to his man-baby rage on full display. The whole time I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to work for this guy. His fuse was way too short and his anger was out of hand. I gave him a price, which admittedly was the I don't want to do this job price and didn't hear back from him until months later. Todd called me later that year. He explained that he had found an electrician from three states away and had paid the electrician with ceramic tiles instead of cash. The problem now? Well, he needed an inspection from the city electrical inspector. I agreed to meet with the inspector for him, which I would bill him for. I went back to the house about 20 minutes before the inspector showed up 
and saw numerous issues. When the inspector arrived, we walked through together. Every issue I saw, the inspector also saw. He pointed them out, and every time, I agreed with him that the work was not up to code. This inspector kept looking at me with a puzzled expression. After we did a complete walkthrough, I finally explained to the inspector that I didn't do any of the work and was hired to get him to pass the inspection. He asked me if I thought he should, and I told him, absolutely not. I got paid for my time, I got paid to repair all the violations, and I formed a strong relationship with that inspector, who was always lenient with me on all of my future jobs. My wife is cheating on me with her gaming friend. I, 26 male, and my wife, female 25, have been married for just under two years. We've been together for over five years, and we have a daughter together who's turning one next month. I started to see a change in our relationship about a month after our daughter was born when I went back to work. She became increasingly distant with me and more withdrawn. Any sorts of affection stopped, and I just felt like I was worthless to her. At the same time, she was spending an increasing amount of time on her maternity leave gaming with a group of online friends that she's known for a few years, most of which are male. I've never had a problem with this, as I know the people in this group, but I felt this group of friends was being put first before me. And at the same time, there was one person in particular from the group that she was talking to a lot of the time, which I felt uncomfortable about. When I confronted her the first time about how I felt, she had admitted she lost feelings for me after our daughter was born, but that she wanted to make things work and that there was nothing going on with anyone from this group and that I should trust her. However, fast forward to a couple of weeks ago, I felt like things had not been improving. It was at this point that I checked her messages and found that she was having an emotional affair with someone from the group. I confronted her about this and she admitted to it. She said that she had lost feelings for me as she said before, and then she had gained feelings for this other person and that she let it get out of control. She said she wants to fix our relationship as she's worried that she will lose me and everything that we worked for and that she was so sorry for doing this to me. I'm not convinced that she's telling me the truth, but I'm willing to try and rebuild our relationship for the sake of our daughter and the fact that I do still love her. However, I've told her that the only way I'm going to be able to rebuild any form of trust is if she stops all contact with this group of friends indefinitely and to not speak to them again. She thinks I'm not being fair about this. So tell me, am I the jerk for asking her to do this for me? She doesn't want to cut contact with the person she admits she got romantic feelings for? Were she sincere about wanting to fix and rebuild your relationship, that's a natural first step that she should take on her own accord. You should not even need to ask her for it. Not the jerk. She's staying with you because you are security. Don't let her use you like that. Not the jerk. She asked what it would take and you answered. Plus, wanting to continue contact means that she's putting herself in a position where she knows there is potential to revert to the affair, which means she is doing something that is putting the recovery of your relationship at risk rather than doing everything possible to make it successful again. And that's even if she wants to stop the affair at all, which is an open question. Not the jerk, but okay. To play the devil's advocate, cheating is the worst thing in a relationship in my humble opinion. But in have to say, there are details missing here. Yeah, in have to say that you can shut up. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Never stay with someone who's cheating on you. Would I be the jerk for losing every wrestling match I'm forced to attend on purpose? I'm 15, male. School has recently restarted all of the sports programs after almost a year of no or limited activity. Before that, I was part of the swim team, one of the smaller groups at our school. I love swimming and it really sucked that we couldn't go for such a long time. With the restart, the school also made a new system. Every student writes down three different after-school activities in order of interest. So first choice is your favorite, Second is your second favorite and so on. The teachers in charge of the groups then pick the students. First pick is students who already belong to the groups before lockdown. Second pick is then random and third pick is if there are still places left open in the group. Since I was part of the swim team before and put it down as my first choice, I would basically be guaranteed to get in. But now the results are out and I was placed in wrestling. I never even put that on my list at all. So I went to the teacher and asked what's going on. Turns out, the teacher in charge of wrestling specifically requested me for whatever reason. Turns out, my dad knows the wrestling teacher quite well and asked for me to be placed on the team. I know my dad hates that I prefer swimming. He always says it's not a real sport and that I should do some sport that actually gives me muscles. He constantly tells me I'm too skinny for a guy and has made several attempts to make me go to the gym to work out. 
I ask the teachers if I can still switch teams, but they say no. I also cannot just avoid the wrestling club because after school activities are mandatory. So last night I had a huge fight with my dad. I called him a jerk for forcing me to go to wrestling and that I'll just forfeit every single match I have to attend. He said that if I do that, he'll take away all my electronics and I will only be allowed to leave the house for school and nothing else. My mom says I should have the right to choose whatever sport I want, but now that I'm on the wrestling team, I should still do my best. Also, to not call my dad names. But I don't want to participate in something I have zero interest in. I was forced into it. Also, I was really looking forward to swimming again and meeting my teammates. Edit. Next week, I will talk to more teachers, guidance teacher, and also write to the principal. Guess I'll also try to talk to my mom again and maybe convince her. Worst case, I'll just go through with it and put in zero effort if no one listens to me. Edit 2. I talk to my mom again without my dad nearby. She still thinks I should give wrestling a try, but if I really want to change, she will support me. So next week, I'll go and talk first to my swim coach and the wrestling coach and hopefully get it resolved. Otherwise, I'll go further to the principal. I can post an update next week and tell you guys how things worked out. Some of you suggested I go to the newspaper or something, but I really don't feel comfortable blowing things up like that. Slandering the school would backfire 100%. I also got a few questions about the rule of afternoon activities being mandatory. So we have to do activities for two years total, but we're free to choose when we do them during high school. We can choose between a lot of club activities offered by the school, not just sports, but all kinds of activities. Music, art, reading, gardening, or even game design. School club activities are always free, and if you require financial assistance for like an instrument or something, I think you can get financial aid, but I don't really know the details. Additionally, if we attend a club or regular activity outside of school, we can also get credits for that. Just need to work it out with the teachers. We also don't get grades or anything. It's just noted on our final report. I also don't really know what happens if you don't complete them. Update. First things first, I'm back on the swim team for now. Today was really weird and awkward. First opportunity, I went to talk with my swim coach and explain the whole situation and that I'm not willing to stay on the wrestling team. He was pretty mad at my dad as well as the wrestling coach, so he took me to the secretary, explained the whole thing, and asked her to change the list. She was in turn quite mad because apparently the whole system is a big mess. I'm not even remotely the only student who was misplaced. So then the secretary called in my homeroom teacher. There was a lot of accusation. I was just standing there feeling awkward. Really weird to see three adults being mad at each other. In the end, I was basically told by all three to just ignore the whole thing and that I can just join the swim team if I want to. I figured that was it until the end of the school day then the wrestling coach had me come to his office. He gave me a long talk about how disappointed he is, how he had high hopes for me, blah, blah, blah. I told him I really don't care and that he was a jerk for just ignoring what I wanted to do. To sum up, wrestling coach is mad at me, homeroom teacher is mad at me for complaining, Swim coach mad at this school, and my dad is probably going to freak out when he hears that I won't wrestle. Oh well. Update. Mom told dad about the switch as he came home from work. He has so far completely ignored me. Not a single word. Actually, a nice outcome, I guess. Update. Last night, I had a talk with my dad and my mom. It was awkward. Dad apologized for the wrestling thing, but also said he wants me to grow up strong so that I can defend myself. He says swimming won't help me when I get in trouble. I was really confused about that because I never have been bullied or gotten in trouble or anything like that. Mom later told me that my dad used to get bullied a lot in high school, so he started working out in college and that helped him a lot. I guess he wanted me to do the same. It's really weird at home at the moment, but I guess he is not a complete jerk. Still kind of, but I don't know. Am I the jerk for yelling at my husband over bread? Whenever I buy something out of the ordinary with a specific dinner purpose in mind, my husband manages to find it and eat it. I'm sure if I were planning to bake something and bought yeast, I would come home to find him completely distended and surrounded in empty yeast packets. I usually stick to the same grocery list every week and I feel like if I buy something out of the ordinary that is clearly an ingredient for a larger meal, he could at least ask before devouring it. Last night, I bought two baguettes which I have only ever purchased to make French bread pizza for him and our kids. I bought these at 11 p.m. and they were not even here 12 hours when I saw them on the counter, with the first six inches ripped off of each loaf, scanned the house, and saw my husband chewing. If it had been one loaf, okay. If he had used a knife, maybe. But the fact that he didn't ask if they were going to be for dinner and then ripped off the top of them, 
this was just unforgivable. He insists I should tell him when I buy things if they are for a specific purpose. I say that I'm already taking on the burden of grocery shopping and cooking, and the least that he can do is ask. Am I the jerk here? Edit. 1. We have two snack cabinets that he's free to snack from, not to mention whatever's in the fridge. 2. The bread was in a cabinet that is mostly ingredients. 3. There was regular sandwich bread for the taking that was unharmed. 4. For those who have stated that this is raccoon-like behavior, it really does feel like I'm running a wildlife rehab operation, but the only patient is a 37-year-old software programmer. 5. To the dude who said that my husband is going to leave me for another woman who will give him peace, tell me you're still bitter about how things ended with Sheila without telling me you're still bitter about how things ended with Sheila. Update. I shared this with my husband and he accepts his jerk status and apologized. We're going to work on communicating better and he's going to work on his weaponized incompetence. He wants you to know he occasionally cooks rice and beans and lately has been making us late night quesadillas when the kids are asleep. But most of all, I was just hungry. My husband. <laughs> I was, yeah, he was hungry, all right. Not the jerk. OP shouldn't have to label every food item that comes into the house, especially since this is a pattern. The husband should learn to ask first. It's not hard to say, hey, are you saving these baguettes for something? Because if you're not, I want to tear six inches off each one of them and leave the mangled remains on the counter. It's like he's marking his territory. You're not the jerk. May I suggest that whenever he does this, you simply refuse to cook unless he goes to the store and replaces what he ate? Also, hang a sign on the kitchen. All food in the kitchen is for a specific purpose. Ask before mindlessly devouring. He won't stop until he realizes the problems his actions are causing you. You have to make this his problem. Am I the jerk for refusing to take part in sibling moments during my dad's wedding? Title sounds weird, I'll explain. So my dad is engaged to a woman, Ruth. Ruth has an almost five-year-old daughter, Lacey. Their wedding is planned for January, and ever since Ruth and Lacey moved in with us, dad and I, Lacey and I have been forced to share a room because it's a two-bedroom house. Lacey has become obsessed with me. She thinks I'm the coolest person, and she always wants to be around me. So Ruth came up with this idea of having sibling moments during the wedding where we embrace each other as true sisters for the first time. She mentioned it to Lacey before either her or my dad mentioned it to me, so Lacey was really excited and happy. But I'm not comfortable with the idea. I don't want to hold her during a family unity ceremony. I don't want to do a special sister dance with her where the spotlight is on us, and I don't want to make promises that I'm not sure I would keep. The promises were already printed out by Ruth, and she showed me what I would need to say. It's basically, I will always answer her calls, always call her my sister from this day forward, that I will be there for her and chase away the bullies and show her how to do things. It's not that I'm opposed to us being closer at all, but I won't be going out of my way to come home from college just to be there with Lacey. I might not even stay at my dad's when I do because I don't want to share a room with Lacey. I already hate doing it now. I expressed that I didn't want to do these things during the wedding and Ruth was furious. My dad was like, it would be so sweet and would be super cute to look back on when watching the wedding videos. Ruth was saying how excited Lacey now is and how I would crush her heart and soul and stomp on them if I refused to do it. She even claimed Lacey was saying how excited she was to have me as a sister forever and that she wants me to be her protector. Not sure I'd buy a four-year-old saying that, but whatever. Ever since I said I didn't want to do those things, I've been under a lot of pressure to give in and Ruth has been accusing me of rejecting Lacey and refusing to have anything to do with her. That's not what this is, but I don't love Lacey right now and I don't know that I will be playing the big sister role. It might be more like cousins because honestly, I'll be moving out soon as I'm 18 to get a little more space, but this whole thing is starting to get to me. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but Ruth is a major one. 1. Lacey should not have been told about this unless OP had agreed to it. 2. Forcing a relationship is a bad idea. 3. Making a public spectacle of a forced relationship is an even worse idea. And 4. Ruth needs to stop weaponizing Lacey to try to convince OP to go along with it. Ruth needs to back off and let any relationship develop naturally. Lacey is acting age appropriate and being a nuisance to OP. Hopefully she'll grow out of that, but OP should not be forced to undertake these wedding activities. It's not OP's wedding, so this arrangement wasn't OP's choice, and Ruth and Dad should stop acting as if this is a major union by OP and Lacey. It's not. 
It's Ruth and Dad's union. Lacey and OP are just affected by it, but they don't have a say in it. Am I the jerk for telling my family my daughter's name is none of their business? I, 25 female, had my first baby with my husband, who's 25 male. Our daughter is named Calla to honor my grandma. She loved Calla lilies and always thought Calla would make a pretty name. My husband and I wholeheartedly agree with that and the name seemed perfect for our daughter. The choice to name her Calla instead of Elizabeth, my grandma's actual name, was a controversial one among my family. You see, there are pretty much only three or four names for each gender circulating within my family. Everyone is named after everyone and always has the exact same first name and usually last. It's a real pain and not something my husband or I wanted to keep up with. My grandma even hated it. My grandpa was a very domineering man and he chose to name their kids names that already existed in his family. She had zero say and she hated it. I remember complaining to her one day that I hated sharing my name with four other family members I saw all the time. She told me every person deserves their own name and she never liked how our family had to all have the same names. This is when I also learned how hard my grandpa was on her and how he basically treated her horribly and made decisions for her when they were married, which was pretty much pressured by both their families. She was the one who told me about honor names being more special if you don't use the actual name but something about the person or what they loved. So maybe a virtue name based on a virtue for the loved one or their favorite flower or plant, place they loved, or their birth month or stone. We lost her two years ago and it was awful. My husband adored her too and she adopted him as a grandkid when we were kids. He and I were best friends before we became boyfriend-girlfriend. For us both, it made sense to honor her and doing it how we felt was better but also how she felt was better. My family have really pushed the idea that we were wrong to name her something weird that is not Elizabeth, and they say I should not say we honored Grandma. I never asked for their opinions, but they gave them and would not stop giving them and insulting the choice we made. So I snapped and told them my daughter's name is none of their business, so they should keep their unwanted opinions to themselves. They told me there was no need to be rude, and I should be willing to hear honest feedback from people who love us. They claim naming is very much a family business in my family, and I should also know and respect that. Am I the jerk? So not the jerk. Kala is a beautiful name, and you should be able to honor the grandmother you loved any way you want to. She's your daughter, not your family's, and she's the one who has to live with the name, so good on you for not letting them push this bizarre naming is a family business narrative on you. Not the jerk. It's a beautiful name, and the background is beautiful too. It sounds like your grandma would be so happy with this honor. You're the jerk. Let's be honest, the name is weird. I would never name my baby something like that, and your family has the right to check you on it. Kala would be okay for a cat or a dog, but not a baby. Stop normalizing goofy names for kids. So you're claiming I defrauded the company by booking an extra three minutes? No problem. I worked for a water company for 25 years and was one of their most productive repair crews. That is, until the new manager, let's call him Mr. Jerk, started. We had a monthly rotation where you're on call for one week in four for emergency repairs out of hours. On the day in question, I started work at 7.30 a.m. on a Friday and finished work at 3.15 a.m. on Saturday morning, so a pretty long shift. I get to work Tuesday morning and get called into the office by Mr. Jerk and I'm informed that according to my vehicle tracker, I'd left the yard at 3.12 a.m. and not 3.15 a.m., which is an attempt to defraud the company. As you can imagine, I was absolutely fuming at this level of BS. I told him that at the time I was covered in mud and sweat and just wanted to get home after completing a monster shift for the company and he was genuinely making a crap storm over three minutes. He said he was making me aware that I could be fired for it. Cue malicious compliance. I said that if we're going to be this petty, you can take me off the emergency contact list for extra coverage and I won't be starting 20 minutes early each day either. I'll now be clocking in at exactly 7.30 a.m. and I shall be heading out at exactly 5.30 p.m. No deviation whatsoever. And you can explain to your bosses why productivity is down and you're struggling to get coverage for emergencies. We'll then see how important your three minutes are when they're costing the company money. Little did I realize at the time, but the guy's job was bonus related and linked to our productivity, which tanked after that because all the other gangs followed my lead, except the brown nose gangs, obviously. 
Three weeks go by with an absolute crap show and customer service complaints about their work not being carried out in a timely manner. My productivity dropped from seven jobs per day down to four. And Mr. Jerk gets called by his bosses to try and explain what's going on. He tried to spin some BS story that I would turned all the guys against him for no reason and that this was the result. Little did he know that I'd actually trained his boss when he first started with the company 15 years before and wanted to come out and find out what we do and experience how hard the job is. He surprised me by working a full month on the repair crews before going back to the office. Anyhow, the boss calls me in to find out what's really going on, so I explained how he had used the tracker to monitor what time I'd left the yard and that I'd guesstimated my finish time and overestimated by three minutes because I was absolutely exhausted after working a long shift. Conclusion, manager was let go for misuse of the tracking system as it's only supposed to be for emergencies and not for monitoring, and we had our on-call system reviewed to cut the hours we were having to work. When will new managers learn to not mess with veteran employees? Probably never. Am I the jerk for telling my neighbor I'm not taking or picking up her son from school anymore? I, 43 female, am close friends with my neighbor, 42 female, and we both have kids that attend the same high school. We don't live far from the school, but it's not really walking distance. My neighbor has work early in the morning and there's no one home when her son has to go to school, so I've always let him ride with me and my son. As for picking him up, my son has football practice directly after school, so I don't need to pick him up. However, my neighbor's son doesn't have any practices, so I find myself going to just pick him up often. His dad can pick him up, but his dad also works a lot and goes on business trips almost every other week, so again, it's mostly just me. Earlier this week, my neighbor was off work and I asked her if she minded taking my son to school with hers since I had a work call that morning and I had to take it. She said no, which kind of had me taken aback since I figured she'd just do it. I asked her why and she told me, you're home, you can take him. I was honestly just speechless and so I took my son that day and she took hers. I called her later that day and told her I thought it was pretty rude that she wouldn't take my son when I take hers every single day. She told me that her son doesn't have any other option while mine does. I told her that she should show some appreciation for me because if it weren't for me, her son would be walking three miles to and from school every day. She still kept repeating the same thing, that I'm home so I can take my son, and I told her if that's how she feels, I'm not taking her son anymore. She screamed at me, but I just hung up. I stuck to my words, and yesterday I didn't take him to school, so he had to walk. He ended up being late and my neighbor texted me an angry message about how I'm ruining her son's attendance. My husband noticed the text and asked me what it was about. I told him what happened and he told me that although our neighbor was being a pain, I shouldn't just refuse to take her son because it's not his fault and it's too far to be walking. Now I don't know if I'm wrong or what to do. I feel like it's reasonable to not want to take him anymore since my neighbor doesn't value what I've done for him. But I also see my husband's point of view that it isn't her son's fault and three miles is a pretty long distance to walk. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. It really sucks for the kid, but that's a result of his parents' actions, not yours. I might change my mind if the kid was really apologetic about how his mom acted. Did he ever express his thanks for all that you've done for him in regards to the rides? If so, maybe you should keep taking him, as he's not aping his parents' behavior. OP. He's a good kid. He always says thank you after we arrive to the school and I drop him off so it does make me feel a little more guilty. He hasn't said anything about the recent event, but I haven't seen him since it happened, so I don't know if he would or not. You're not the jerk, but honestly, if I liked the kid, I'd still drive him in the morning, but not pick him up anymore, and I'd tell him why. Am I the jerk for leaving my sick husband to spend time with friends? Context. I'm 31 with two sons, a full-time 12-hour shift worker, and I'm in a full-time doctorate program. My husband is therefore the primary caregiver many nights when I'm working. We have full-time daycare during the day and he works from home. The other night we had a date night planned. We were going to go out to dinner, then had plans to go to a bonfire with friends. We got a sitter, I got all done up. Dinner started great, but hit a sour note when my husband made the comment that he was disappointed we weren't doing something more exciting. I took it to heart because I was excited for the night we had planned, so I was moody and quiet. We were still in a tiff heading back home to change for the bonfire. When it came time to meet our friends, they said they were finishing dinner and having a drink or two at a nearby restaurant and asked us to join. 
My husband said he'd rather take the time to take a nap, then he'd meet us for the bonfire after. I did say I'd prefer he come with, but he declined. So I went, had one drink, then came back to get him for the bonfire. He had texted while I was out and said that he had thrown up, but still planned to go with me to the bonfire. I got back to pick him up and asked if he still felt up to going to the bonfire and he said no. I asked if he wanted me to pick up the kids from the sitter early and get them to bed so he didn't have to while I was out with our friends. His response was, I don't care, I don't really want to go get them. So I did go pick them up and brought them back and got them to bed. He was still distant, so I left to follow through with the original plans. I was out for two and a half hours and got home before midnight. I took care of the kids for him to attend a golf tournament with his two guy friends for nine hours the following day. When he got back from golfing, he expressed frustration that I had left him that night, stating that he had never leave me when I was sick and that the point of the night wasn't to go see friends, it was to spend time together. I explained that I work non-stop and to me getting out of the house, out of routine and having time to laugh and joke with friends was important. I explained that I would have rather spent the time with him, but he never, at the time, indicated that he wanted the time together. He wasn't feeling great and said at the time that he just wanted to go to bed. I had texted him several positive and caring messages while I was out and I got no response. He encouraged me to make a post on Am I the Jerk because he insists that no good spouse would leave their sick husband to spend time with friends when the plan was to spend the night together, saying that I ditched him. I said he should have expressed to me that the time together was important to him and not been cold towards me, expecting me to abandon our previously made plans and sit at home again, then cover for his golf outing with friends for 9 hours the following day. Not the jerk, but your husband sure is for trying to turn the argument around on you. Why don't you point out how he ditched you for 9 hours of golfing with his friends even though he felt bad the night before? That sure was a fast stomach bug. Not the jerk. Not so sick he would cancel golf the next day it seems. Throwing up is an odd one. Usually a stomach bug lasts more than one night. Even mild food poisoning would leave him too wobbly to go golf the next day. Did he drink too much? Not the jerk. So he wanted you to stay home and what? Watch him sleep? Is that his idea of quality time? New neighbor is demanding I cut down my peach tree. I, 46 male, have an apple tree in my backyard and a peach tree in my front yard. I'm currently living in my parents' house with my wife, who's 46. My mother and father planted them. They passed and we decided to plant more. I only trim them when the branches get too big. They're mostly for the wildlife in the nearby woods. The deer love to come and eat the fruit. I don't spray them with any pesticides as they aren't for human consumption. I work during the week and don't get home until the evening. I haven't had any issues with the neighbors as the house is mostly in the countryside and surrounded by woods. A few weeks ago, a new neighbor moved into the house next door. I haven't had any interaction with them until now. I was not aware that the neighbor was coming over and grabbing fruit from my peach tree. I got home yesterday and the neighbor was standing on my porch. She comes storming over to my car and says the peaches made her and her son sick. I told her that the fruit was mostly for decoration and for the wildlife. She starts screaming at me and threatens to call the cops unless I take the trees down. I told her no, I'm not going to take the trees down. My wife suggested going out to the grocery store and buying her some peaches just to keep the peace. Not the jerk, let her call the police and if they show up, explain to them that she was stealing your organic stone fruit. Definitely don't buy her anything, that could be construed as liability. OP should contact the police to report the interaction regardless. This woman had the audacity to come onto your property and steal from you then complained that they got sick from the fruit that they stole. Considering her angry reaction, she may try and cut the trees down herself. Keep your guard up, OP. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Tell her to go ahead and tell the cops. It would save you a call to report the trespasser entering your property and taking your fruit. What a loon. Do not buy her peaches to keep the peace. That's goofy. Tell her to stay off your property to keep the peace. Throw a bottle of Pepto at her kid to keep the peace too. Am I the jerk for feeding my dog table scraps from a dinner my boyfriend made for me? I, 24, female, have been dating Jay, 28, male, for four months. He's handsome, smart, funny, well-educated, has an awesome job, and he's a sweetheart. Sunday, he had a whole day planned for us. We were going to walk a nature trail and then go back to his place for dinner he was making. I was so excited 
because it was going to be the first time I'd be at his house. Since we were hiking, he said I could bring my dog Shelby with us. He made us a roast and some vegetables for dinner. I finished my plate before Jay did and took it to the kitchen. There was still about half the roast left and it was close to Shelby's dinner time, so I took half of the roast and some still raw vegetables from the fridge to put on a plate for Shelby. I was carrying the plate to the back door with Shelby to feed her outside and Jay asked me what I was doing. I told him I was feeding Shelby. Jay said something like, well, that's not dog food. Jay knows I mainly feed Shelby a raw diet. I opened the door to put the plate down for Shelby and Jay got up, took the plate away from her, went to the kitchen and came back with it wrapped up in tinfoil and told me to leave. His excuse was that he made dinner for me and him, not me, him and my dog, and that I should have asked before I helped myself since he would have used his leftovers. I did leave, but not before telling him that he made that meal for us so I could do with some of it as I pleased and he knew darn well how I feed Shelby. I tried talking to my friend about it later that night, but she said Jay was right to be upset, but this friend has never really approved of how I treat my own dog, so I feel like she was probably a bit biased and the wrong person to ask. Am I the jerk for just feeding my dog like I normally would? Clarification: She does not get restaurant food daily. I eat out maybe four times a month. If what I eat is dog safe or if the restaurant makes food for dogs on request, then I bring some home for her. Shelby's daily meals are a bit of brown rice, raw vegetables, and ground chicken hearts and beef livers. The hearts and livers are boiled just enough to kill bacteria, and that's all with the approval of Shelby's vet. I asked Jay how he prepared the roast so I could know if it was safe to give her. That's also why I got her fresh, unused vegetables from the fridge. Update. I accept that I'm the jerk for what I said and did to Jay. Some of these responses were harsh, but I see now how and why I was entitled thanks to people that respond to the actual issue. Others going on about her diet, thanks for the concern, but I came here to ask about Jay, not get into a debate about dog food. Shelby's been on her diet for six years and is a healthy and active pup. That's all I and my vet need to know. As for Jay, I apologized to him and he did accept my apology, but he broke it off. He said it was the last straw for him over me doing things without asking first. He's talked to me about taking things off his plate or his drink without asking before. I've tried to do better, but keep slipping up. I didn't realize I was that bad about it, so I'm going to work on myself for the next guy. For people that said not going to his place for four months was a red flag, that was my decision that he respected. I don't want to go to someone's house or let them know where I live within the first few months of dating and getting to know each other. Yes, you're the jerk. Your now ex-boyfriend made a special meal for you. You took a large hunk of that special meal and gave it to your dog. Not only that, but you did so knowing it would upset him. You should have brought dog food to feed Shelby. You should not have fed Shelby with people food and you should particularly not have fed your dog with the special dinner your now ex-boyfriend had prepared for you. It is wholly irrelevant that Jay knows you mainly feed Shelby a raw diet. Edit. Also, the title of your post is misleading. Table scraps are what's left over on your plate after you finish eating. They are not a quarter of the roast your boyfriend prepared. You're the jerk. A quarter of a roast is not table scraps. How is the fact that you mainly feed your dog a raw diet at all relevant? Also, holy entitlement, Batman, at you made the dinner for me so I can do with it as I please. By that logic, it would have been perfectly acceptable to flush it down the toilet. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her ex-boyfriend? Please let us know. Some people just have no social awareness whatsoever. My former crush married my brother and thought I'd be okay with it. I, 25 male, used to have the biggest crush on my childhood friend, Emily, who's 26 female. As a teen, I wasn't very assertive and a little awkward, so I never made a move and just hoped that one day Emily would realize that I was the guy for her. The only person who I openly admitted my crush, although it was kind of obvious, to was my brother, Liam, 28 male. He was much more assertive and confident than I was, and it had plenty of girlfriends, so I went to him for advice about Emily. Given the situation at the time, you can imagine my surprise when I caught Liam and Emily hooking up. I know that she technically was never my girlfriend, but it still sucked and I did feel betrayed. Turns out they hooked up at a party once and liked the encounter so much that they kept meeting up to do this when no one else was around. I felt completely sick and basically just distanced myself from Emily after that, 
which could be really awkward because we had a lot of classes together and we had the same shift at the part-time job we had, a job that Emily frequently depended on me to give her rides to. I just wanted to remove Emily from my life completely, but during the summer of our senior year, she and Liam sat me and my parents down and explained that Emily had gotten pregnant and they were planning on keeping the baby. My parents weren't happy while I just got up and locked myself in my room. All I could think was, well, crap, now she's never going to go away. I purposefully transferred to an out-of-state college so I wouldn't be home as much and lied about getting stuck in traffic when I missed Emily and Liam's wedding and I showed no interest in my niece, Daisy, who's eight, although I still make the effort to be polite when I'm around them. Recently, Emily's father passed and she's really going through it because despite him not being around, she always desired a relationship. When we were kids, I remember all those times I was a shoulder for Emily to cry on whenever she felt sad about her dad and I guess she was longing for that type of comfort from me and kept reaching out. One day I relented and I let her vent, but I maintained a silent and formal demeanor on the matter. After spending about an hour crying, I offered Emily some water and then she asked me why I was being so cold, how I know how much she needed a friend right now. I calmly yet firmly told her that we were just kids then and that if she wants that level of emotional intimacy, then she needs to go to my brother, her husband, because I stopped being her comfort person a long time ago. Emily cried even more, left, and has managed to send Liam, my parents, Emily's mom, and from mutual friends to call me up and tell me I'm heartless and sad for being so spiteful. I can honestly say that I am now over Emily, but that doesn't mean I'm willing to be as close to her as I used to. So, am I the jerk? ETA Had to step away, and after looking at the comments and DMs, I just wanted to be clear about some things. 1. Did I exhibit some nice guy traits as a teenager? Yes. As an adult, I now realize that Emily doesn't owe me a romantic relationship. 2. I was more angry at my brother than I was at Emily, because, you know, he was my brother and he knew. 3. I don't see how me not taking an active role in the life of a kid that I didn't make is me punishing someone. I say hello and I give gifts on Christmas and holidays. 4. Again, Emily is married, so I find it odd that she would seek out someone who isn't her husband for emotional support. 5. Yes, I did give my condolences when I found out about Emily's father because it was the polite thing to do. Then she started trying to call me to talk about it. 6. Emily and I haven't had meaningful contact since high school, partly because she was busy getting ready to be a mom, and I was hurt and trying to get over her. 7. No, Liam and I aren't close anymore either. ETA 2. 1. Yes, I have a girlfriend, and from what I can tell, we're both very happy. 2. Yes, my girlfriend knows about my former crush on Emily. 3. Also, in spite of everything, I did learn to be more forthcoming with my feelings, which is why I told Emily that I can't be her comfort person, although I will admit that there could have been a better way and better timing to communicate that. You had a crush in high school on a girl, but never asked her out. Somebody else did, and she married them. It's a decade later, and you still ignore her kid, who is literally your niece, because you're salty about it. Dude, this isn't healthy. Please get help. I have to put you're the jerk, but like, this is beyond am I the jerk. You've spent nine years being so bitter. That's really sad for you. I don't think you're the jerk for telling Emily you can't be that person for her, but you're definitely the jerk for spending so much time being angry and obstinate. Don't spend the rest of your life like this. It will only bring more of the same. My Karen stepdaughter demands my late husband's estate. I, female 55, had been married to my husband, male 60, for 20 years before he passed. It was cancer. He had two kids from a past marriage who were in their early teens when he married me. I had a 7-year-old from an earlier relationship as well. We didn't have any more kids. I tried to treat my stepkids as my own, but they never accepted me. They were very rude and insulted me whenever they could. Since I did not work, they called me a gold digger who married their dad only for his money. The truth was, my grandparents were quite wealthy and left me a lot of money when they passed. I lived well below my means and I chose to stay home and raise my daughter since I could afford that. I did not need his money at all, but I didn't bother sharing this with the kids and told him not to either. I did not want them to like me just because they might gain monetarily from me. My husband, on the other hand, hated how they behaved with me. Their blatant disrespect made him not pay for their college tuition. Their mom couldn't pay for it and they had to take loans out for it. They didn't even talk to him. 
Even when he got cancer, they refused to come and see him. For three years, we struggled with the treatment. My daughter came to visit from time to time when she could. During this time, the only person who really helped both of us was someone we were not related to at all. This girl was in her late 20s, waitress at a cafe that we frequented. She was a single mom, taking classes at community college at night, working during the day and raising her two kids. She took a liking to us, and when she learned my husband was sick, spent whatever time she could visiting him. She has stayed nights at the hospital when I needed a break and basically been the daughter that we wished for. When he passed, she helped me arrange the funeral. His kids came on the day and all they wanted to know was about their inheritance. I felt sick. When I learned my husband had left his estate to me, whatever is left after settling his bills, it was around $25,000. I decided to give it to the girl who helped us both so much. She tried to refuse, but I insisted she take it. She needed it and in my opinion, deserved it more than the ungrateful kids. My daughter understands why I did not give it to his kids, but is upset I did not give anything to her either. I told her she already had money and a job, not to mention she will get my inheritance. This was in no way her money. But his ex-wife and kids are causing havoc over this and really upset with me. They're calling me a jerk for giving away money that they deserve. Am I the jerk? They don't deserve that money. They want it. There is a difference. I just went no contact with my parents literally two to three days ago. I know the odds are that they will cut me out of their will. I'm 100% okay with this. Being free of their toxicity is 100% worth giving up whatever money they may give me. In all honesty, I don't know how I will feel if they do leave me money in their will. Do I even want to accept it? I honestly don't know. Taking the money won't fix the damage they caused. His adult kids made choices in life but now that he's gone, now that all of it is said and done, now they are demanding money. I would look at them and say, aren't you quite the gold diggers? You know your dad never funded things for me. I was wealthy on my own. That's why I didn't work. I didn't need the money. Not the jerk. First of all, an estate of $25,000 is very small. It's not the size of an estate that people even normally ask about or fight over. It's surprising in me that your kid and your stepkids were expecting some windfall when your husband's total net worth was $25,000. Were they under the impression that your husband had money? If your husband wanted his kids or your kids to have his estate, he would have left it to them. But he wanted you to have it, and you were well within your right and the moral high ground to gift it to someone who made an influence in your life and for whom it may be a life-changing gift. You'd be surprised how many people fight about money even when it's a smaller amount, like $25,000. $25,000 is honestly not that much at all. If my parents passed and all they had to leave me was a measly $25,000 after all these years, I wouldn't even want it. Most new cars even cost more than $25,000, so I don't know what his kids are throwing a fit about. I made it clear to my parents that unless they left me their house, cars, and retirement accounts, then I would be going no contact with them. Boomers have treated us like crap for far too long, we have to take matters into our own hands at this point. People saying $25,000 is not a lot of money. Only on Reddit, Karen. Only on Reddit. I found out after my husband passed that he had another son he had been hiding from me. My life was turned upside down last month when I was informed of my husband's passing in a work-related accident. This would, of course, be hard enough to cope with, but shortly before the funeral, a young man showed up at my house claiming to be my late husband's son. My husband didn't speak a word about him to me. He claimed to have not known about me or either of my daughters, who were 12 and 8, until he was notified of my husband's passing and found the obituary in the online version of our local paper. The young man was 18 and must have been born before I met my husband. He also claimed his own mother passed years ago and was never, to his memory, in a relationship with my husband. So, the boy's existence is not proof of infidelity on my husband's part. However, I still feel just as betrayed. My husband never breathed a word of him to me. This boy lives in the UK where my husband sometimes worked. I live in the US. He traveled a lot in his line of work and I can't help but wonder how many other secret kids did he have? How many times did my husband visit this kid and never even told me about it? What else was he not telling me? This boy had pictures with himself and my husband at various ages. He says he was brought up at a boarding school and my husband visited him sometimes. Though I very much want to, I have no reason to doubt his story. The boy asks to come to the funeral. I want to say no, but I feel like I have no right. My kids see me talking to this stranger and poke their heads in to ask what's going on. Before I can stop him, 
the boy introduces himself as their half-brother. Now, not only do I have to figure out how to cope with all this information myself, but I also have to find some way to explain it to my kids. My eight-year-old doesn't even seem to get the full implications of her father keeping this kind of secret from all of us, but my 12-year-old is clearly upset, although she won't talk about it with me. At the funeral, the boy kind of lurked in the corner, but when lunch was served, afterwards he approached both my daughters and was playing games like tag with my eight-year-old and some of her friends who joined in. I didn't think this was right, and when I told him so, he apologized and said he did it to raise her spirits and it's what people did for him when his mother passed to cheer him up. Something about his answer irked me, so I got the impression he was trying to manipulate me into feeling sorry for him and using my kids to do it. My mom and my sister came over to help me after I got the news about my husband. Of course, I talked to them about what was going on and they were shocked. My mom brought up the point that the boy might be after money. All of our important assets were in both our names and I'm the only beneficiary of his life insurance policy, but I was not sure what could happen if he tried to sue. I asked the boy frankly if money is what he was after and he said, no, I couldn't take any of your money. You have kids to take care of. It irked me the way he said that as though I was offering money and he was trying to show how good he was by turning it down. It felt as though he expected me to give it to him anyway. I asked the boy what he wanted and he said he wanted to get to know my kids because they're his sisters. In my opinion, they might be his sisters, but he's a stranger to them regardless of biological relation. Apparently at the funeral, he told my 8-year-old he was going to ask me if he could take them to the aquarium and so that got her hopes up about it before I could even make a decision. I said yes, only if my mom or sister went with them because I wasn't about to let them go with a stranger no matter what. Over the next week, he also took them to the park, ice cream place and the lake with my sister as a chaperone every time. I agreed to this and it was helpful because it gave me a chance to break down and cry to my mom without them around. When he left and my 8-year-old hugged him and told him not to go, he said, I promise, I'll come visit again. I stepped in and said, No, I think it would be best if you didn't come back here. He looked hurt and my 8-year-old started crying, but I was sick of him promising things without getting approval. She thinks it's a cool mystery, like from a TV show, that she has a secret brother and she doesn't realize how disturbing it is that her father hid his existence. My sister asked me later why I told him not to come back, and I told her I think the whole thing is weird. I don't know this boy, or his real intentions. He could be some kind of weirdo. My sister says I judged without ever getting to know him, and he seems like a very sweet young man. He grew up mostly without a family, and he could have been jealous that my girls got all of their father's attention, but instead he wanted to connect with them. My opinion is that even if those are his intentions and he's totally innocent, I still don't want him around my home or my kids. To me, he's just proof that my husband lied to me for years and it makes me sick to look at him. My kids don't need this drama either and even my 8-year-old is going to have issues once she's old enough to realize how much her dad was hiding. Me or my girls don't owe him anything. My sister says that I don't have to want him in my life, but I don't have the right to deny the girls their brother. She pointed out social workers do everything they can to avoid separating siblings because of the trauma. I said it's not the same thing because my girls have only known their brother for a week. My sister said it's also important because my girl's brother is now the only person they know of their culture. My husband was like one-eighth Hawaiian, the rest white and Asian, and so the girls and their brother are like one-sixteenth. The boy appears to be white and my daughters and I are black. But this boy was raised in the UK and he isn't part of Hawaiian culture. And honestly, I think culture is something natural and not something to force because of your genetics. My girls don't live in Hawaii. They live in Oregon, so that's their culture. I don't force myself or them to participate in African culture just because of our genetics. I thought my 8-year-old would get over her brother, and she did go several weeks without asking about him. But yesterday, she asked about him again. I feel bad about ever allowing them to go anywhere together and bond. I wish I'd handled the whole thing differently, and now I don't know how to explain the situation to them. My 12-year-old hasn't asked about her brother, but she has been extremely closed off since her father's passing, and I don't know how this issue might be complicating what she's feeling. I just need outside opinions to know what to do about this. I thought about maybe asking the boy about a DNA test, but I don't know what it would achieve. I don't want him in my life or my daughter's life either way, and even if the DNA test came back negative, it would only raise more questions. 
and I don't know if it would open up any legal troubles where now I owe the boy money from my husband's estate if it comes up positive. Not the jerk. Call me a skeptic, but get a DNA test first. Something about this entire situation sounds fishy. I wouldn't even have let my kids hang out with him. The way he phrases his answers does sound manipulative. What people did for him when his mom passed. He didn't need to convey this information to you during your husband's funeral, but he did. The way he phrases it sounds like he's trying to make you feel bad for trying to establish boundaries. And yes, it sounds like he's trying to guilt trip and gaslight you, making you feel like you're crazy and paranoid. Further, he didn't outright reject your money. He phrased it yet again in a way that he's fishing for a longer haul. He could have easily said, no, I don't want your money. But instead, he said, no, I couldn't take any of your money. See the difference? And the moment you let him into you and your kids' lives, he has been persistently around. Offering to take your kids out without you or any adults being present indicates the possibility he's manipulating them to get what he wants. The appropriate approach would have been to ask if you, as the parent, are fine with him taking them out. He has now heavily inserted himself in you and your kids' lives, all through your kids. You need to start asking questions. Alarm bells are ringing in my head. OP. Well, the comments alerting me to how this might be a scam attempt have opened my eyes. I've contacted a lawyer to figure out how to establish if there is truth to his story and what my legal obligations are to the boy. I'm also going to have a long talk with my sister to see if during their outings he had done any kind of prying that might have led him to learning information about my family that he could use somehow. I'm already in the process of getting therapy for my kids and myself. Edit. People have been saying a lot of nasty things about me and I don't think I'm going to get much more productive input out of this, so this is going to be my last post on this topic. I considered taking the post down, but I decided to leave it up so people can be aware of the scammers that operate like this. That they can be so good at what they do that even hundreds of third-party outsiders will take the scammer's side. In hindsight, I can't believe I didn't see it, and I can't believe I ever let such a person step foot in my home or even speak to my kids. Apparently, the goal was not to ask for money right away. It was to get close to me and my kids and ask me for money later on for a fake emergency. Other commenters elaborated how it works. If my daughter asks about her brother again, I'll have to tell her that she was tricked. I don't want to do that to her unless I'm completely sure, so I most likely will be asking the boy for a DNA test, birth certificate, etc. However, not until I have the chance to speak to a lawyer. Update. I was wrong and I was the jerk. My husband's son was telling the truth. My husband's name wasn't on his birth certificate, but the DNA test did show he was related to my kids. He also had more photos, cards, and voicemails. Tons of evidence to prove that my husband did keep regular contact with him. Apparently, the son's grandparents were his legal guardians. My husband occasionally gave them cash as under-the-table child support. I did notice that husband sometimes made large withdrawals when he went overseas. He said it was because shops there don't take his card. I wanted to believe it was a scam because I thought it made more sense than husband having lied. Talking to my husband's son a bit more revealed he had been lying to him too. Apparently, he told him he was a cowboy and a pro football player. Then when son googled him, he switched to saying he was a gangster who had done prison time. Needless to say, none of this is remotely true. I can't fathom what could possess him to behave this way. Lying to me, lying to his kid, not raising his kid. I'm questioning everything husband ever told me and wondering if it was me who passed. Would he have abandoned our kids as well? I feel horrible for the boy. I'm in therapy and working on ways to cope and forgive my husband for my own peace of mind. She's helped me work out why I reacted to husband's son the way I did. I thought he was manipulating me and my kids, but what I actually sensed was that he wanted something from me and my kids. I felt like me and my daughters were not in a place to give anything emotionally or financially, so I recoiled from him. But that doesn't mean that he's a threat. My kids went to therapy as well. 12-year-old has weekly sessions. However, my 8-year-old hated it, so I pulled her out of it for now. Many people have shared their own stories of being separated from biological relationships and the effect that it had on them. I don't understand it because genes don't mean much to me. However, I don't have to understand to respect it. I personally don't feel like I'm in any place to have any kind of relationship with husband's son and I don't think he wants one with me. He now appears scared of me, which I do feel bad about. I wasn't trying to hurt him or scare him, but I will allow him to visit sometimes if my daughters want to see him. Sister agreed to continue to supervise. As far as money goes, the lawyer advised me that there aren't many assets that son is entitled to because they were in both my and my husband's name. 
except for a few investment accounts that were only in my husband's name. Thankfully, not where the majority of our savings were. I know people think I'm an evil jerk for caring about money, but I need it to feed, clothe, and educate my kids. I just don't think I can do it. I didn't choose to be a stepmother. I'm sure the boy doesn't really want me as one either. I apparently scared him when I told him not to come back, and when we talked on Zoom since then, he acted nervous and flinchy, like he was afraid I was about to get him or something. I feel bad about that as it wasn't my intention. I don't think I can do this. I feel like the meeting is a disaster waiting to happen. Like it's only a matter of time before I lose my temper and ruin the meeting that my kids may have been looking forward to. I just have this feeling of dread. I don't know if anyone can help. Maybe it's a long shot. I have therapy on Thursday and I hope it'll help me sort things out. I just feel like I can't do this. It's humiliating to even share this problem with anyone. And even if I try to talk things out with one of the few people I do trust, it's always think about your kids, think about your husband's son, put yourself in their shoes. People even show more sympathy for my husband than me. Maybe it was a coping mechanism for his childhood issues. Maybe he had a good reason. I'm just burnt out on putting everyone else first and trying to fill the role of both parents for my kids right now. I feel like it's only so long before I snap and the rope just got a lot thinner. Update. To let you know how the visit went, he stayed for one and a half weeks. Before he came over, we talked a few times on Zoom with me, him, and his grandparents. I told him my sister was not going to be able to supervise and I was frank about how apprehensive I was feeling about being the one to supervise. I don't think he was thrilled about me supervising either. He knew and felt comfortable with my sister, but not me, so the feeling was mutual. But we decided to go ahead with the visit anyway. We made a few changes in what they had previously planned when my sister was going to supervise, but not many. We also discussed contingency plans for if something went wrong and one of us needed space. Just knowing that I would have an out if I needed it was a huge relief and helped immensely. Overall, things went relatively well. He and I were civil. I got uncomfortable, but not to the point where I couldn't cope. He and my daughters got along well, with the exception of one incident when my girls got into a spat with each other and he tried to intervene, which made them both mad at him. But it was quickly resolved after each girl had their time stewing about it. I will say he was very good with both of them, but especially my eight-year-old, who's been having a very difficult time lately. She's been struggling a lot with school and trying to find the right treatment for multiple diagnosis. She's been acting out and has been very frustrated. I love her and I do my best, but she is difficult at times. But with her brother, it's like they're kindred spirits or something. He was a real trooper acting out scenes with her from the movie Encanto over and over. I realized it's probably really good for her to have an adult in her life who doesn't want anything from her except to spend time with her. Before the boy left, I gave him a thank you card expressing this to him and that I do genuinely hope he chooses to stay involved. Overall, it was a positive thing. I'm glad we went ahead with the visit and thank you to those of you who left supportive comments. Update. My husband's son came for another visit last month. It didn't go well. He brought his girlfriend. She was polite but not very interested in my daughters. I think my nine-year-old was a bit jealous that she had to share her brother's attention with the girlfriend and was a bit mopey and prone to many meltdowns during that time so it wasn't the most fun time ever for anyone. Unfortunately, my husband's son and his girlfriend are invited to Thanksgiving at my parents' house. We'll see how that goes. I at least feel more accepting of him being around now. Last year, it was hard to even look at him. I know none of this is his fault, but it was hard to see him as his own person and not just a reminder that my husband lied. And this year, I felt a little better. Am I the jerk for forcing my brother to buy me a new engagement ring? I, 26 male, am proposing to my girlfriend who's 24 on our four-year anniversary, September 30th. I've been planning this for about a month and I picked the ring a couple weeks ago. The one I got was on sale, so I managed to get it at a surprisingly low price. Last weekend, I told my brother, who's 33, about my plans. I showed him the ring. He informed me that he was proposing to his girlfriend as well. The next day, my brother came to my apartment while my girlfriend was out. He asked me if he could borrow my ring to propose to his girlfriend. At first, I thought he was joking, but no. His plan was to propose to his girlfriend, explain he was using my ring as a placeholder, and then take her to pick her own ring later. His reasoning was that he didn't want to spend too much money right now in case she didn't say yes. I had never heard of placeholder rings, so I said no, and the conversation moved on. On Tuesday, he proposed to his girlfriend with my ring. He had taken it before leaving my apartment. I got distracted at work and didn't notice it was gone until his fiance sent a picture of herself wearing the ring to our family group chat. 
I called him to ask about the ring, and he immediately apologized and said he'd keep his promise and give it back to me. But at this point, my girlfriend had seen it, and his fiance had posted about it on social media, so it was pointless for me to propose using the same ring. We fought about it, and he confessed that while he had told his fiance the ring was a placeholder, he didn't tell her where he'd gotten it from. I felt more angry and betrayed about him going behind my back and taking the ring after I said no than the fact that he stole it. I also know his fiance enough to know she wouldn't like to learn her engagement ring had been stolen from me, so I told my brother I'd tell her the truth if he didn't buy me a new engagement ring. He fought against it for a few hours, but finally gave up and agreed. We went to a different jewelry store yesterday and I picked a new ring. I managed to stay in the price range, but the new one was still $100 more expensive. My brother bought the ring, but is still accusing me of being inconsiderate and childish. He is insistent that he would have given the ring back had I given him the opportunity, and I didn't need to threaten him to spend so much money on me. He's now refusing to talk to me. I don't know how to feel about this anymore. I'd usually talk to my brother about these things, and it's surreal that he's the one I'm fighting. I can't tell my fiancé, and many of our friends overlap. The only other person who knows about this is our mom, who's divided. She thinks what my brother did was wrong, and I'm right to be upset with him, but that I didn't have to stoop as low as I did by threatening his relationship. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. What's wrong with him? He stole your ring. Does he have some illness or impairment that could excuse this, or is he just the worst brother in the world? OP. He's actually never done anything like this before. We usually have a great relationship. He was the first person I wanted to tell when I first started dating my girlfriend, and that I'm proposing to her now. Not the jerk. Your brother created this entire situation and is 100% at fault. If it were me, I'd make all four parties sit down and explain everything. You might as well rip the band-aid off now because it's going to come out sooner or later. It will be much worse if it's later. Some like it hot. I had taken an R&D internship for a food company over the summer in a town in Iowa. For housing accommodations, the company had set me up in the local college dorm that was previously a retirement home so it basically had individual rooms and bathrooms, but one large commercial kitchen. It was summer, and the school didn't have a summer program, but allowed two fall students to move in at the beginning of the summer. One was rarely there, but the other was constantly in the building, and oftentimes had multiple friends over. Given the kitchen setup, we all stored our food there, and it's pretty no-brainer that you shouldn't take from others, but immediately I had various food items going missing or being consumed regularly soda, empty boxes of cereal put back on the shelf, etc. I initially posted a sign on the fridge to not eat others' food and also confronted both about having food going missing after the sign was up, but it didn't stop whomever from stealing my food, especially when I'd head out of town for the weekends. After complaining about the situation to my manager during my job, they helped formulate the perfect pro-revenge. Given I was doing R&D work on food products, I was responsible for getting various ingredient samples to use for new recipes. My manager suggested I get some capsaicin extracts for my research, even though we weren't doing anything in that realm for flavor profiles. Well, I found a company that had various Scoville unit extracts, and I asked for a variety to see what worked best for our applications. Well, they delivered some with small 2-ounce bottles of 50,000, 100,000, and 250,000 Scoville extracts. I ended up putting the 250,000 in a travel size spray bottle, mixed with some water to help as a carrier, and wearing gloves and a mask, borrowed from work, I doctored the common food items being stolen with a liberal spraying of my mixture, mainly cereal, chips, crackers, jug of milk, and the lip and top of a few soda cans. For the snacks, I actually put some into a separate bag and left them open to dry before mixing back into the original packaging. I did this in a different dorm room in my wing, as I know well enough how potent this can be in enclosed spaces. I did this right before another trip out of town, and when I returned, I found some of the chips and cereal and milk was missing, plus two of the three soda cans I had doctored. I never got to see the result, and no one ever said anything, but none of my food went missing for the remaining month of my stay. I hope the experience was enlightening for them, and they still remember the time they played with fire. Do this next! Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.